let's start this um, this session, uh, second day of this webinar on, on TIA4 resistant banana biarities. Thank you very much for your participation and welcome again uh, to another session of our TIA4 Global Network webinar series, which aim to provide updated news on TIA4. My name is Victor Prada and I am the secretary of the World Banana Forum, a multi-stakeholder platform of assembly to address the main challenges of the banana industry. Our platform is hosted in FEO headquarters, accurately in the Trade and Markets Division. Um, and I would like to uh, acknowledge the support provided so far to make this webinar available by the uh, World Banana Forum TIA4 uh, Global Network members, uh, TIA4 Task Force, our colleagues in FAO, in the Supreme Office in Panama, because without them, this wouldn't be possible. This ongoing series of dialogues, dialogues um, on a topic that is urgent, that is complex, uh, is multi multidimensional, is also an opportunity to strengthen the relations of different stakeholders with different methodologies and varieties for the benefit of millions of rural families who depend on banana production to survive. So today, as you, as I mentioned before, our webinar is on tier four resistant varieties. Very quick, I would like to remind you the housekeeping rules. Uh, kindly keep your microphone always muted or well, while you are not speaking, of course. If you would like to intervene, we would like to ask you to raise your hand or write in the chat box and we will give you the floor as soon as possible. As is customary, the webinar will be recorded and the, this recording will be, made, will be available in both the TR4 Global Network website and the FAO YouTube channel. Please use the question and answer section that you will find close to the chat box, to the chat bottom, to formulate your questions. Because if you formulate your questions in the chat box, it is difficult for panelists or even, even for us in the Secretariat or in FAO to address those questions. And those, those questions get diluted in, in a vast amount of messages received in the chat box. So please use the question and answer section to formulate your questions for panelists. Then important for uh, our interpreters already providing simultaneous interpretation in Spanish and English in the interpretation uh, bottom is that you try to speak clear and slowly. If you feel that your sound quality is not sufficient, we can wait and, and fix that those problems. If it's possible, do not use the built-in computer microphone or a conference call microphone. It will be better if you use a headset. Try to connect, of course, if it's possible with a wire instead of Wi-Fi. And then um, I think that's it. Um, ah. It will be important if you can use uh, your video, you can switch on your camera while you are speaking, because that's, uh, that makes the work of the interpreters easier. And of course, without a mask, if the distancing rules in your place allow you to do it. So that being said, I would like to uh, give the floor or the screen to Pascal Liu, um, senior economist, as you know, in the Trade and Markets Division and team leader of the responsible global value chain team. Pascal, you have the screen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of FAO, welcome to the second day of the webinar on TR4 resistant banana varieties, organized by the World Banana Forum and FAO's sub regional office for Central America. Uh, I will uh, quickly repeat the, the background information that I presented yesterday because not all participants today were already present in the session of yesterday. So just you know, a little bit of background for the newcomers today. The World Banana Forum is a multi-stakeholder platform created in 2009, and it includes all stakeholder groups of the global banana sector from producer organizations, exporters, importers, supermarket chains, governments, research institutes, development agencies, unions of workers, consumer associations, environmental associations, and other civil society organizations. The forum operates through three working groups, each of one corresponding to one of the three dimensions of sustainability, economic, social, and environmental. And it also operates through task forces. 
Now, the Fusarium Wilt TR4 is a great concern for the WBF and its members. It's been spreading from Asia and the Pacific to other regions going westward, and then reached the Americas in 2019, with the first reported case in Colombia, and was also reposted, reported in Peru last April. As a result, you know, from the spread uh, over decades of the disease westward, the, uh, so the steering committee of the World Banana Forum created in 2013 the Task Force on TR4, which gathers experts from research institutes, national plant protection organizations, companies, development agencies, produce organizations, and non-governmental organizations. Moreover, in 2020, two years ago, the World Banana Forum and AFO launched the Global Network on TR4, which plays the role of a global hub for dissemination of knowledge and good practices on TR4 and how to combat it. Also, it plays the role of early warning system for producers and exporters. It also disseminates uh, extension materials and training materials. It also plays a role in coordinating global efforts to ensure that these efforts you know, have, are made in synergy and to reproduce duplication of efforts. The global network on TR4 has hundreds of participants and it reaches out to over 2,500 people involved in the sector. It can count on the experts from FAO's plant protection division and also experts from the you know, regional and sub-regional office of FAO and the WBF secretariat and those also the experts of the task force on TR4. So why is the TR4 so challenging for the world banana industry? This, the fact is that once it is in the soil of a banana farm, TR4 is almost impossible to eliminate and it can stay there in the soil for decades. No conventional management method is able to get rid of it. And also the spores of TR4 spread very easily. For example, they can be spread by floodings, by wind, by the movement of people, animals, or materials and equipment. So it requires heavy and costly biosafety measures to be contained and to protect the farms. And this is you know, already very costly for medium and large scale farms, but for small producers, it's even more of a challenge due to their lack of, of resources. So developing varieties of bananas that are resistant to TR4, or at least tolerant of TR4, looks like one of the most sustainable approach to addressing this challenge. So today we will hear about uh, work streams in this area. We already heard yesterday about a few examples of uh, development of varieties. So today we will hear more examples and Victor will introduce the agenda for today. So Victor, the floor is back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pascal. I also thank to, thanks to all of you for your participation yesterday. Um, now, as you can see in the, in, in the screen, the agenda for the second day, as we did yesterday, we divided the session today in three blocks, in three sections. Um, the first one is on conventional breeding and resistant varieties to DR4 provided by CATAS. Um, the second one will be on gene, gene editing on, and DR4 resistant in Cavendish, uh, provided by James Dale and Lina Tripathi, and also by Eli Kajat. And the third block will be uh, provided by Miguel Dita on obstacles and opportunities for banana cultivar diversification. So um, then, as is customary and really appreciated, Raisa Jauger from our office in, in, in Panama, the, in Mesoamerica, will provide the closing remarks. So um, I'd like to remind you that this webinar is the first one of, on varieties out of a series of webinars on TR4 organized by the TR4 Global Network then it's important for you to know that we try to uh, we try today to have as many relevant specialists as possible taking into account the length that a webinar can have um, but of course this is not totally comprehensive there are many other um, panelists and specialists or entities working on tr 4 varieties and they could also be here so this is uh, the first one of a series that we would like to replicate in the near future so um, these entities would be, for example,
uh, the uh, um, International Atomic Energy Agency uh, in the United Nations or people in China, in Wandong, people from Embrapa, uh, we received some information from India. Therefore, we really appreciate if um, you, if you have information out of entities working on new varieties and you think that that could be useful for us and the TR4 Global Network, we really appreciate if you can send us an email or communicate with us and inform on these uh, entities or, or scientists, and then we will include them as panelists in future locations. So very quick reminder for panelists, please stick to the time allocation um, agreed. If you need more time, as we will have all the webinars in the future, we will have the, the opportunity to continue the discussion. But it will be good if we can stick to the time allocation. Therefore, um, uh, everybody, every panelist will have the chance to, to speak. Then uh, I would like to start with this section on breeding tr 4 resistant cultivars and application in South China. This information will be um, provided by Professor Johanna Liu and Professor Zhou Xin Wei that will share a presentation on this resistant germ plus materials developed by mixed techniques, conventional and mutagenesis by the Chinese Academic Academy of Tropical Agricultural Sciences, CATAS. Professor Liu is a researcher and professor from the Chinese Academy of Tropical Agricultural Sciences. Her research focuses on banana important characters regulation and genetic improvement. She is responsible for more than 15 national and provincial level scientific research projects. She has invented and registered more than 15 patents. As one of the important breeders, her work developed a new technique of radiation mutagenesis and directional breeding and developed the Thongre number no. one banana variety with high resistance to um, Fusarium tiafor. Together with her, Professor Wei is a researcher and professor from the Chinese Academic of Tropical uh, uh, Agricultural Science, CATAS again, and the head of the Banana Germ Plants Resource Nursery in Hainan province. His research uh, is mainly focused on banana germ plus resources and cultivation technology. He formulated several agricultural industry standards in the country, received several hours, and led the development of the Boadao and Ba Bedo varieties, considered one of the best alternatives to for Fusarium TA4 in infected areas in China. So, Dr. Liu, the screen is yours. I will stop sharing now because I understood that you would like to share your screen. So please press the bottom to share your screen. Okay. Perfect, okay. we can see it really well. The screen is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, Nice to meet you in this webinar. My name is Ji Hua Liu. My colleague, Professor Shu Xing Wei, is sitting side by side with me. We come from Catus. We are members of China Agriculture Research System. It's my great honor of having this opportunity to talk something about breeding TR4 resistant cultivars and applicating in South China. The outline includes five aspects. First, in the background, the threat of plant fusarium weeds are quickly spread of TR4, lack applicable resistant cultivars, no matching cultivation techniques. In order to jointly Tackling these problems, the government concentrates the national scientific research forces to fund China Agriculture Research System, CARES, headquartered at CATAS. This system is under the leadership of, chief, of the chief scientist, 
Certain scientists, including John Plyden's collection and the evaluation, breeding techniques, variety improvement and the cultivation, etc., are responsible for resistant cultivars breeding and the techniques development. Other land integrative testing stations, which are scattered in nine main blend producing region, regions, are responsible for promotion and application of resistant cultivars with corresponding cultivation techniques. The purpose is to support the sustainable and highest development of blender industry. With the efforts of CARES, several TR4 resist resistant cultivars are bred and selected. The one is Zhen Rei number one, which is bred by radiation mutagenesis and then Baodao, which is selected from the lateral mutation. Reke number two and the Nantian Fang are also selected from the lateral mutation. Fen Zha number one is bred by hybridization. Next, I take Zhen Rei number one as an, an example to have reintroduce uh, it's breeding process and uh, take about the, as an example to carefully introduce the planting techniques and the application. Two, breeding general number one. Nowadays, natural mutation is the main way to breed new varieties. The essence of natural mutation is somatic mutation. However, this method exists two shortcomings of time consuming and low efficiency. Radiation is another way to breed new varieties. This method also exists shortcomings of time consuming and low efficiency. After 12 years investigation, we developed a new technique for radiation mutagenesis and the directional breeding, improving the efficiency of somatic mutation. First, the breeding process. The embryonic Kelly and the adventitious shoots are regenerated from the immature male flower of Bashi, which is blonde Cavendish. These materials were irradiated by Kubat 60 after recovery culture. These materials were infected by faculty of crude toxin. And then directed screening. Hundreds of young plants were obtained. This method improved, improved beneficial mutation rate for four percent. Two, TR4 selection of young plants in liquid culture. We designed a liquid culture device for tissue herd culture plantlets and construct a symbiotic system for seedling and the pathogen spores. Realize directed screening of TR4 by using GFP as a marker. It is intuitively homogeneity, controllability, and higher efficiency. Three, Higher TR4 incidence field screening of germ plasms induced by radiation. After planted in the higher TR4 incidence field and the screening, a total of 44 beneficial mutations have been self cultivated. One of those is Zhen Rei number one. Three characteristics. Generally, number one showed higher resistance to, to TR4. Under the same conditions, the rate of disease for general number one is only 4%, where the CK reached 
93.3%. Even the symptoms, the symptoms are later onset, later symptoms, strong recovery ability, later obstruction of vascular. Zhenzhi Lamboman showed hair fruit quality for its beautiful shape, dark green color, smooth fruit surface with loose buds. The nutrient composition is the same as Bashi. Zhenzhi Lamboman has obtained the cultivar authorization on June 18, 2021, granted by the Ministry of Agriculture and the Rural Affairs of the People's Republic of China. Four, integrated planting techniques. Because resist resistant cultivars should special characteristics such as sensitive to low or higher temperature or damage. It is very important, important to develop pl planting techniques suitable for them. We develop a five-in-one integrated control system. This system includes soil pathogen detection, soil regulation, resistant cultivars, biofertilizer, no or less tenets. In this system, the resistant cultivars are the core. The sire passage detection is the instruction. Sire regulation is the foundation. Biofertilizer and low or less tenets are supplements. One, sire passage detection. <clears throat> This detection can understand the relationship between the pathogen spores and the disease rates. For example, if each gram soil contains pathogen spores are less than 1,500, the disease rate will be less than 5% and we, are, we will give the, give the plant a suggestion that this soil is suitable for planting any cultivars. If the spot number between 2,000 and 500 to 3,500, the disease rate will be 10, to 20% 20, 20 and we are suggest the planters use resistant cultivars with soil regulation. If the spot number <clears throat> are more than 5,000, the disease rate will be, will more, will be more than 50% and we are suggest the plant or farmers not that this soil is not suitable for any cultivars. Two, soil regulation. In, this technique includes soil disinfection, pH value regulation, and the increased organic matter. This is the agricultural fertilizer the application of agricultural fertilizer can <coughs> regulate the pH value. Soil regulation can increase microbial diversity, improve ecological environment, create a comfort comfortable environment for banana growth. Three, bare fertilizer we isolate rather square microorganisms such as nectococcus, bacillus, streptomyces, pseudomonas, and then ferment, fermented. After fermentation with organic matters, the biofertilizer are produced. 
for low or less tenets. This technique is trial based to avoid crossing friction and the root damage. Five, application of the integrated control system. This system was su su successfully applicated in such China. This is in Guangdong. This is in Guangxi. This is in Yunnan. This is in Hainan. Two, take like training. 213 training courses and on-site meetings were conducted. And 14,199 enterprises, planters, and farmers were trained with this system. Three, achievement. A total of land key testing stations and 45 fixed monitoring points have been established. The rate of disease was controlled less than 10%. Harmless and manageable control of TR4 was realized. The application area reached 30,000 hectares. Summary. Under the leadership of the government and uh, CARES, five human integrated control system was developed. Scientists trained this system to enterprises, planters, and farmers. Thus, therefore, shorten the distance from selection to market demand. This is the Chaos family. It's a big family. Professor Jiang Feixie is the chief scientist of Chaos. Professor Zhi Zhi Qiangjing, Professor Shu Xingwei, and Professor Yi Xianxie are scientists. It's me. All of the family members are participated in the breeding of Zhenli number one and the application of Baudo. Thank all the family members cooperation and the contribution. Thank World Blood Forum Secretariat. Thank FAO. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu. Highly appreciate it. Is then your presentation finished, isn't it? Did, did you finish? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me, Dr. Liu? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. There's, uh, we have uh, maybe, uh, considering the time, because it's very late for you, we were planning to have the question and answer section uh, afterwards, but maybe we saw that there's a question in the chat box that might be uh, good for you. I would like to ask um, <coughs> Mateus um, if you can at least formulate one of the questions. Mateus, uh, can you please open the microphone? Yes, Peter, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Leo. And there is many questions actually in the Q&A section. Uh, I will select one of them. There are a lot of interest regarding the spores because you mentioned the quantity of spores. So there is one question asking regarding the amount of the proportion of chlamydospores and other spores in the soil. And other question uh, relevant asking about the how the toxins are obtained. If you can answer very quick these two, or you can merge in order to answer. Thank you. The microphone is closed.
first we we cut we cut uh, the uh, tr tr four uh, fusarium with uh, bacteria and then uh, sh shaking and uh, 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 and it's extracted from the uh, from the bacteria liquid bacteria. Mm -hmm. Okay. Concentrated. Con Concentrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, Doctor Doctor Liu, thank you very much for your support and for your uh, um, reply to this question. Maybe we can address those in the chat box or maybe in the future by email. But we really appreciate your presentation. It was uh, extremely insightful, and then um, we really appreciate your participation in this webinar. Okay, then let's let's continue then with the next uh, panelist. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let me then share my screen. Um, now we go to gene edited and TR4 resistance in Cavendish. I guess that you will be able to see my screen now. Um, Dr. Uh, James Dale, when I introduce you, would you like to share your screen? Can you please let me know? Yes, I will. I can Okay, then I don't need to share mine. Wait a second. Okay, then um, uh, our distinguished mixed, uh, Professor James Dale is, as you know, because most of you know him, he is a banana, he's part of the Banana Research Program leader in the Center for Tropical Crops and Biocommodities at the Queensland University of Technology. He received several awards. He, Dr. Le Dr. Dale holds a PhD in in plant sciences by the University of Sydney and has been involved in biotechnology research for more than 30 years with a specific focus in development of disease resistant uh, in genetically modified bananas among several other topics. His team has recently developed an efficient protocol to generate non-GM uh, gene edited Cavendish plants and his experimental station is conducting experiments with resistant bananas to Fusarium TA4 for more than five years with interesting results. We are pleased to pass the floor now to pass the screen to Dr. James Dale that will present the advancements and his research on his research on genetically modified and gene edited Cavendish bananas for resistance to TA4. Dr. Dale, thank you very much. This, we cannot see your screen yet. Yeah, I'm just going to it now. Yeah. Fantastic. But it's not coming up. Isn't that annoying? Otherwise, we are ready to jump in and, and put it for you. But please, maybe oh, okay, here it's coming. Yep. Here it is. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. The screen is okay. Yours. Well, thank you very much, Victor, and uh, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody around the world listening. Um, I'm going to rattle along because I'm uh, covering two quite large projects, one on genetically modified and the other one on gene edited Cavendish for TR4 resistance. So when we think about uh, what, what the reality of the future of export bananas is, and, and, and I'm looking slightly longer term here, um, the, the two major strategies are either going to be through conventional breeding, which will come up with a, a banana cultivar, which is different to Cavendish, but obviously with disease resistances, high yielding, transportability, extra taste and texture. The other opportunity is to genetically modify or gene edit Cavendish and other similar bananas, uh, but developing those with multiple disease resistances. And we're obviously in that, in that second strategy. We've been working with genetic modification for quite a long time now. Um, we've, uh, we, we identified, or oh, nearly, nearly uh, 20 years ago, 
uh, a, a gene called IGA2, which is a, a resistance gene from a wild banana. And we, we transferred this gene by genetic modification, by agrobacterium transformation into Cavendish, and began small-scale field trials in 2012, and they ran for three years. And essentially what we did is we took this IGA2 gene, um, which is an NBSLRI gene uh, that occurs in Musericuminata subspecies Malacensis, and we transferred that into Cavendish Grand Name. I should say that this gene, RGA2, uh, occurs in virtually every banana, but in the vast majority is not expressed. Um, so we took these uh, a number of lines um, to our, our, our field trial site at, at Darwin Fruit Farm. This is a commercial plantation area. It's been severely affected by TR4 for more than 10 years. Um, and so we were planting on a commercial site which had already been heavily infested. And we collect, collect, <coughs> collected uh, the complete history of every plant in the trial and confirmed all um, infections by PCR and many also by sequencing. Uh, after three years, and we, we had also had four controls in there, uh, GC, TCV218, uh, Williams and uh, Grand Nine Cavendish and DPM25. This is the result after three years and five cycles. You remember yesterday, most people were talking about two cycles when they, uh, when they reported their results. We took this one out to five cycles. And we had four uh, lines, RGA24, RGA, RGA22, RGA23, 24, and 25, all had high levels of resistance, one of which RGA23 had very, very low and no infection. So that, that was pretty exciting. So one of the things we also did was, was, was look at the accumulated infection rate over that three-year period. And as you'll see, the, the red lines, um, uh, the controls, particularly uh, 218 Williams, DPM 25 and Grand Name. You'll see over those, over those five cycles that the incidence continues to go up quite dramatically over those five cycles. Whereas the transgenics either tracked right along the bottom there, that's RGA23, and the other ones uh, were less than 15% um, infection. So it was pretty exciting. Um, and we, we published that quite a few years ago. So most people are aware of that result. <clears throat> However, we then took those plants to a much larger field trial and with the idea of taking the best lines through to deregulation. So this is the field trial site. You can, this is the actual field trials you'll see in that, that top. It's, it, it's a large field trial. Again, it's in the Northern Territory of Australia, Darwin Fruit Farm. Um, so this time what we did was to mimic uh, a commercial plantation. We wanted to really see how these plants performed uh, under, under a commercial plantation situation. Uh, it was a complete randomised block design and we took four of the RGA2 uh, Grand Nain lines uh, that we identified in phase one. We collected uh, yield, cycle time, long-term history of each plant. And we're uh, just finalising that manuscript. Okay, so this is after three years. Uh, this is the infection rates. So... Uh, the grand name control after three years was around about 58%. Um, we now have renamed these, uh, these lines QCAB2, 3, 4, 5, et cetera. Um, the best one, QCAB4, after three years had no infection um, and Williams was up to about 68, 68%. Another uh, QCAB3, very good, around about 6%. This is after, uh, after three years. Um, so this, this graph actually shows six cycles. So this is from the plant crop right through uh, to the fifth return. And you'll see at the top there, Williams, which is a tissue culture control. The grand name is a cell line control. So that's exactly the same cell line we use for transformation. And the two best lines, QCAB4 and QCAB3, tracking along the bottom. It was only in return four did we see one plant uh, of QCAB4 with symptoms of uh, TR4? And then another plant in return five. So very, very low levels of infection after those six cycles. 
So essentially after six crops, um, QCAV4 had only two harvests out of 300 that were lost to TR4 infection. But very importantly, we've been collecting this data. Um, the bunch weight of QCAV4 is equivalent to the grand known control. Uh, and that's, uh, again, over six cycles and the, the grand known control, obviously, were those ones that were not infected. The cycle time of QCAV4 was significantly shorter than the grand known control. So essentially, we were getting, uh, we were getting better yields uh, or equivalent yields with QCAV4 as we were with, with grand known. And I should reiterate that QCAV4 was transformed with a single banana gene, RGA2, which, uh, as I said previously, occurs naturally in virtually all domesticated bananas. Um, so essentially, we've developed a Cavendish banana with close to immunity to, uh, to TR4, and this has no impact on yield. We're now in the process of putting together all the data to deregulate that uh, uh, QCAV4 in Australia, and we'll be looking to uh, expand the geographical distribution of field trials as, as soon as that can be organised. So that's gone along very well. And that really means that we have uh, a safety net of a Cavendish banana, which is resistant to TR4, that will yield essentially as good as uh, the, the grand name that, that is grown around the world at the present time. However, we've also uh, commenced our uh, gene editing program of, of, Cav uh, of Cavendish and also of other bananas. And one of the important things I think I should stress is that with, um, with genetic, mo genetic modification, this is the transgenics and cisgenics, essentially this involves the addition of new DNA into the plant through transformation that almost always includes either new or foreign DNA. And that's always been some of the concerns of some consumers and regulators. Gene editing on the other hand, and I'm gonna particularly talk about non-GM gene editing. So this is really the precise targeted modification of a plant's DNA and can include deletions, substitutions, uh, and through the, or the, through the addition of, of entire genes. So for non-GM editing, and this is really important, there must be no new foreign D DNA added to, um, added to those lines. So that's very important. So very early, we had to firstly work out whether it was possible to, to edit Cavendish bananas. And we, we did this, we use, uh, we use a, the technology, the CRISPR technology, CRISPR-Cas9 technology um, as our editing tool. And what we've done is we've targeted uh, the phytoene desaturase gene. And the reason we've done that is when you completely knock out that phytoene desaturase gene, you end up with a banana uh, that is completely bleached. It's an albino. Uh, so that gives you a very, very good visual marker of, um, of, of the success of that, of that editing. And so we were able to do that. This was the original... Uh, uh, the, the original experiments were through stable transformation, so these were, were GM, but we were able to demonstrate that a high proportion of the transgenic lines contained that edited sequence. And of course, there are three copies where it's um, uh, Cavendish is a triploid. We were getting more than 60% of what we call trilelic knockouts, where all of the um, all of the three alleles had been knocked out. So that's a very, very efficient way of knocking out. So CRISPR-Cas9, and we've published that, CRISPR-Cas9 works very, very well in bananas. Okay, the next stage, and this is where we're moving to now and making this a practical application, is we firstly had to develop a platform for regenerating Cavendish bananas that had been edited, but very importantly, do not contain any foreign or new DNA and that can be adapted to many different banana cultivars. So that was stage one. I'll go through the, the results of each of these as we go along. Um, then we needed to identify the Cavendish genes that, that we were gonna target to generate resistance. And this includes both upregulation and downregulation, um, and it can provide new traits uh, in addition to TR4 resistance, we can 
look at other things as well. And then using edits that are acceptable in different countries. And that's quite a complex regulatory situation, which I won't talk about today. Okay, so firstly, developing that non-GM uh, gene editing platform in Cavendish. Um, so we, we had to firstly get a, a, a system in place, a protocol in place where we could do the edits and uh, regenerate plants. We had to confirm that those edits had been done and we do that by Sanger sequencing, so amplifying across uh, the target region. Uh, and then confirming by PCR, the absence of integrated DNA. And then what we do now uh, is sequence the entire genome and then we can then go in and be absolutely certain that there is no foreign DNA being added to those edited plants. So to develop this platform, again, we use the PDS gene, the phytoene desaturase gene, because it's such a convenient visual marker. So we've, um, we, we start primarily with embryogenic cell suspensions, even though we have looked at uh, generating through, through um, meristems, et cetera, um, but primarily from embryogenic cell suspensions. From those, we can make, uh, we can make um, viable protoplasts. We can actually make protoplasts at a very, very high efficiency now. Um, uh, up to up to 10 to 10 to 15 uh, million uh, protoplasts per, per cell of settled cell volume. So a very, very efficient way of, of making protoplasts directly from those um, from those embryogenic cells. And the advantage of protoplasts, of course, is they're single cells. So it's possible to go in and edit just one of those cells and and, and regenerate from there. Um, so we've also been able to uh, develop a very efficient way of uh, transfecting those protoplasts. In this example, we're using, uh, we're using GFP. Um, and so we can take those embryogenic uh, cell-derived protoplasts and, and transfect those with a plasmid expressing GFP, and we're getting very high levels of transfection. Um, so the really important part, of course, is to be able to regenerate a whole plant. And so we've now gone through that. Uh, and these are these in, in this instance, we're giving the example of using protoplasts, uh, taking a protoplast single cell, uh, and then being able to demonstrate that going through various stages of multiplication uh, to microcalli formation, fi finally forming those somatic embryos. Um, and that takes around about four months uh, from initiation. And once we get to that stage, we can take those right through. So we now have a very efficient system of regenerating Cavendish plants from a single protoplast. So that's that's fabulous. Uh, where we are now, and, and this is the um, this is the example you see up there on the on the on the top left. This is an example of editing um, banana cells uh, and knocking out PDS. And so you'll see little white plants there. So that's the, those are the ones that have been knocked out. Some of these haven't been knocked out because we don't get 100% editing as we go through these. And because there's no selectable marker, we get escapes coming through as well. Um, we can then, we can then uh, uh, determine by PCR uh, across the, the site which we targeted that uh, we're getting those edits um, in place and we can see exactly what the edits have been. But most importantly, then we go to um, uh, PCR to determine whether any of the plasma DNA, because we're using plasma, any of that plasma DNA has been integrated into the banana genome. So we do that firstly by PCR, and this is the result here. This is one of the albinos where we've knocked out PDS. This is one of the ones uh, where the, um, uh, the placement had actually been integrated. And you'll see that that's picked up by various pairs of primers that we're using there. We then go and sequence the entire genome and look for any of the sequences derived from the plasmid. So you'll see here three different lines. Now here's wild type, sorry, wild type at the top there. Um, uh, this is and two different lines uh, which contain 
none of that plasma DNA. He's a stably integrated transgenic line. So that's a difference. And you'll be able to pick that up very, very quickly. So the reality now is that we've got non-GM gene-edited Cavendish bananas. These ones look white. They're obviously pretty useless from a um, from a practical perspective, but they demonstrate that uh, that we can now do that at a very, very efficient rate. So the next part is to identify the Cavendish genes that we're going to use for editing, and we go through various stages from there. We have uh, access to some fabulous uh, resources. One of the major resources that we've used is our QCAV4 line compared to Cavendish Grand Name. So these two, Cavendish Grand Name and QCAV4, are essentially isolines. They're exactly the same uh, genotype differing by one gene, and that is the RGA2 gene. And the difference is this one, Cavendish Grand Name, is susceptible uh, is susceptible to TR4 and QCAB4 is highly resistant. And so we've been able to go in there and say, okay, what's been upregulated and what's been downregulated in, 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 in the, the, the comparison of those two? And we've also got another set of very, very good, um, very, very good genotypes, uh, Malakensis 852, which is resistant, and Malakensis 848, which is susceptible. And we've done the same thing. So what we've got there is we've identified a panel of 24 candidate genes. Some of these genes would be the sorts of genes that you would expect to identify. Some of them are completely novel and you would not expect or would have, haven't previously been recognised as targets for TR4 resistance. So we've identified a panel of 24 candidate genes. Um, we've now, uh, we're, we're about hmm, just over halfway through editing um, uh, Cavendish cells uh, for those different genes, and they include genes that we're upregulating and genes that we're downregulating and genes that we're knocking out. Uh, and so that's been going on since 2021 and obviously will continue into 2023. Um, and now we're in the process of regenerating those early ones uh, and uh, regeneration is coming along very well, and they will be challenged in the screen house. Um, and finally, going to progressing the promising uh, lines to the field. So, screen house will start to uh, the screen house screening will start to occur at Darwin Fruit Farm um, mid mid this year, uh, mid two thousand and twenty two. And the early promising lines, we believe, will be moving into the field in Darwin in probably late 2022, so not very far away at all. And based on our, um, our previous field trials, we'll know within around about 18, 12 to 18 months whether any of those lines compared to the controls have, have promising levels of resistance. But of course, we'll do what we have done previously, and that's we, we take them through at least three years and at least five years of cycles to be certain. Okay. So where are we? Uh, we've developed an efficient technology to generate non-GM edited Cavendish bananas. So we've identified numerous Cavendish genes that potentially could increase TR4 resistance in Cavendish. And I should say, we're increasing the number of genes as well. We haven't stopped looking. Um, and we've commenced that ed editing. We're actually quite a long way through that now uh, and plant it's coming through. So importantly, gene editing allows a continuous improvement in currently accepted uh, banana cultivars. That's, that's very important. So we can go and edit these, uh, the, these um, Cavendish uh, for TR4 resistance, but at some later stage, we can go back and edit for some other trait. Um, for instance, once we uh, a handle on, on the genes involved in black cigatoga resistance, that would be certainly what we were doing. And essentially, Cavendish and TR4 resistance is just the start. And with, um, with plant genomics and banana genomics moving at such an incredibly rapid, rapid pace, um, this is going to provide us with the opportunity to identify many more genes and traits, and that can be disease resistances, fruit quality, nutrition, and plant architecture. So um, things are looking pretty, pretty exciting from a, a banana gene editing perspective.
So I'm going to I'm going to finish there. Uh, obviously, the sorts of work we do take a large team of people, and on the left hand side, that's the group that is currently involved uh, in the program. And we're getting very good funding support from Fresh Del Monte, uh, Horticulture, in Australia, Horticulture and Innovation Australia, and also a company called the Australian Banana Research Company. So thank you very much. Excellent, Dr. Dale, highly appreciated. Okay, I am mindful of the time, so I'm going to share my screen right away. Um, wait a second. Um, <coughs> Here we go. Then uh, it was a very uh, interesting presentation, uh, Dr. Dale. And um, I really appreciate your participation in spite of the hour. Um, and then here we go. Okay, Mateus, can you confirm if you can see my screen? Now, yes. Yes, Victor. You okay, perfect. So uh, our next panelist is uh, Dr. Lina Tripat. She is the director of uh, the Eastern Africa Hub and leader of the biotechnology program at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, IITA. She holds a PhD in plant molecular biology and she has experience in the genetic improvement of important staple food crops. Dr. Tripati leads the transgenic and gene editing research at IITA based at um, Biosciences for East and Central Africa hub. Her um, primary research focuses on genetic improvement of banana and plantain, cassava and jam for disease and pest resistance. Dr. Tripati will present the CRI SPR CAS9 technique in the development of TIA4 resistant varieties. Dr. Tripati, you have the screen. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Victor, for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, so if you stop sharing your screen, that's so that I can share my screen. Yeah. Absolutely. Please go ahead. Please, uh, we've allocated 15 minutes for your, for your presentation. It would be good if we can uh, stop in, yeah, between uh, 15 Yeah, I'll, I'll finish in uh, 15 minutes, yeah. Thank um, you, I'll appreciate it. Apologies for this. And for your information, we'll have to cut a little bit the Q&A sessions uh, right after because we are a bit late with the agenda, but I think we'll manage to solve that later. Apologies, uh, Dr. Tripathi, the screen is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the CRISPR-Cas9 technique in the development of TR4-registrant bananas. And James, James has already touched on it, so you know it's my task is a little bit easier now. Okay, so um, as he explained, genome editing is the technique used to precisely and efficiently um, making specific changes to the DNA of a cell or organism. So it's like the, the cell, the, the, the endogenous DNA of the cell itself is not the foreign, foreign DNA. And what happens in these techniques is that there are several, several um, enzymes which can like make a cut at the DNA at the specific uh, site and is a double-stranded cut. And after that, the repair happens using the, the cell's machinery itself. And the repair can be the non-homologous and joining repairing, which can create some, some mutation, or it can be the homology directed repair. And, and then that's where actually the insertion uh, can happen. So genome editing can be used to either to add, to remove, or to alter the DNA in the, in the genome. Um, this is basically not new. Nature has been editing the genome for a very long uh, time, creating radiation. But in 20th century, actually, mutations were accelerated using the chemicals and the radiations and later on, the technologies were developed for like more precise targeted uh, mutations. And then, so like, as you can see, like, you know, starting from 1895, when that's when the radiation discovery was happened. And in 1927, there was the first um, plant mutated using um, the radiations. 
Um, so, but then like later on, the CRISPR has rapidly became the most popular genome editing approach for several reasons. And then in, in 2020, actually, the CRISPR-Cas technology won the Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize. And this is still, the technology is still very much evolving. And that's when the new breeding tools are, are coming up. So when we talk about the gene editing, actually not all type of gene editing are considered as the non-GMO. So that's why it's very, very, very important to understand like what type of gene editing uh, uh, and it needs to be distinguished um, in terms of like how it's going so, so that to avoid the regulatory because the regulatory approaches are different for different types. So as I explained that these, these uh, site-directed nucleases, they, they make the cut and then the repair can be the non-homologous enjoining or the, um, the HR type. So if it is a non-homologous and joining, then there is actually no donor template. It's basically the cut and then the repair happens. And during the repair, there, there are the mutations. So these are the targeted but random mutation. And this can lead to the gene silencing, gene knockout, or a change in the, the function of, of the gene, and it's called SDN1. But then in the, the homologous directed repairing, the, the HR type, it can be like a small change where there is a small repair uh, happens. Uh, you have to provide the donor, donor DNA. And, and so it allows the introduction of the mutation at the target site, but is a small mutation. And it's called SDN2 type. And then there is a SDN3 type where there is a donor template is like a complete gene insertion or, or, the, or the replacement. Um, and it allows actually the introduction, it, you can actually insert the full gene there. And this gene can be actually from the same species. So it can be like cisgenic or transgenic. It can be foreign gene as well. So SDN1 and SDN2 types are very similar to the mutation obtained through chemical mutagenesis or irradiation or spontaneous natural mutation. And in many of the countries, like these are the these are the type of the gene editing which are not regulated as GMOs. Um, so there are a lot of benefits of gene editing. Uh, as I said, like you know, these are the two ladies who got the Nobel Prize um, in twenty twenty. Um, and so G there are a lot of technologies for gene editing is not only the CRISPR, but then the CRISPR is now actually the most common. If you see like almost like 68% of the products which are in the pipeline, they are using the CRISPR technology. And you can use this technology starting from the functional genomics for the like developing the biotech stress resistance, abiotic uh, stress resistance, herbicide tolerance, also enhancing the nutrition value or, and then the yield improvement. So this is not only in theory, this is now in the reality. Um, uh, so non-browning mushroom, it was approved in US and Canada. Then there is high oleic soybean oil, which is the first gene edited product which came on the US market. Um, in the gene edited like blight resistant rice was also approved by USDA and Colombian regulators as non-GMO. Uh, they, and then recently, um, uh, last year, uh, Japan approved the first gene edited tomato rich in um, GABA, which is actually which can fight the high blood pressure. And this is actually now ready for commercialization. So in the in banana at IITA for the crop improvement, actually we use all different types of tools. So starting from the conventional breeding. So we have a very strong conventional breeding program. And in the conventional breeding, actually, it can take a little bit longer, is a, but it's a low cost. And there is no regulatory issues involved if you are using the conventional breeding. But you know, the, the crossing the two parents, you need a parent which has the resistant, like if you're talking about the disease resistant, uh, a, a resistance gene. But if that trait is not present in the germplasm, actually, you cannot use the conventional breeding. Then you can, you have to look for the alternate procedures, and that can be the genetic modification. And in the genetic modification, actually, you introduce the foreign gene. It can be from, from plant species, from bacteria, from viruses, from wherever. So 
so this is like in terms of the time it it uh, it takes a little bit lesser than than the conventional breeding so it's a medium time um is a high cost and may, mainly the high cost is because of the biosafety regulation and it requires and and then you know each country has its own biosafety regulatory guideline and you have to follow that so that's the biggest hurdle with this you know, technique and then there is now this gene editing in gene editing actually you can precisely um uh, manipulate the gene um uh, the genome of the banana itself so suppose if you want to develop the the resistant varieties then you know you can work on the genes which are uh, responsible for making those varieties susceptible and it's comparatively shorter in time um, is less costly in comparison to genetic modification and there are if if you are going through sdn1 type there is no regulatory issues similar to GMO. You know that all the products are regulated, but they are not regulated. So SDN1 type uh, are not regulated as GMOs. And then, but then the regulations depend upon the country policies. Not, not all countries has actually the clear guideline um, in place. Uh, so depending upon the urgency, depending upon what is available, we can choose like from which of these three technologies we want to apply. We are not saying if we are doing gene editing, we are leaving the, the genetic modification or conventional breeding out. So we are actually um, using all the three together. So at IATA, um, our, our genetic improvement program of banana and now I will only focus on the disease resistance. Actually, it starts from the selection of the resistant varieties. So if we can select, so this is the short term. Uh, then we have the conventional breeding program. We have the genetic modification program. So we are working on bananas and tumunas world uh, for using genetic engineering, uh, the nematode resistance, and also the control of uh, the banana bunchy top virus. For gene editing, we are focusing on banana streak virus. Um, which we have now the proof of concept. Um, we also have developed recently the proof of concept for banana xanthomonas wilt resistance um, using gene editing. And recently we started working on fusarium wilt resistance and the black sticker toker resistance using uh, gene editing. Um, so at IITA, we started the, this uh, a program for genome editing in, in 2015. Um, so this was the first time approval in, in Kenya from, from the National Biosafety Authority for, uh, for gene editing of banana. We were trying to actually um, develop the, the varieties uh, where the, the for the virus resistance, which is the banana streak virus. Actually, we are trying to um, inactivate the endogenous uh, integrated uh, virus uh, for the um, um, streak virus. Um, so in 2018, actually, uh, uh, we developed um, the, the, the proof of concept uh, for knocking out of the endogenous banana streak virus. We demonstrated that in, the, in plantain. Uh, but in order to actually go for any trait, um, as James explained, you have to have a tool or the system in place. So we also developed the system um, initially for plantain. Plantain has A genome and the B genome. It is also triploid. So we developed the system using the cell suspension. So we were delivering um, the guide RNA into the cell suspension. And so we, we use, again, the same marker which James talked about, phytoin desaturase, um, uh, as because this is a very good visual marker. Uh, you can get, if you knock out the gene, make it non-functional, and you get the complete albino plants. If all the uh, all the alleles were knocked out. So, and that's what we have developed the system. But later on, actually, we expanded this, and we have we have actually validated the system for all various uh, genomic group of bananas. So, like you know, triple A's, um, the Cavendish, Gross Michel, uh, Matoke varieties, like you know, uh, different type of of varieties. Then in 2020, actually, we started. Uh, working for um, editing for the bacterial disease and and the fusarium wilt disease. Uh, so now we have proof of concept for the bacterial disease, and we are still working for for fusarium wilt. And our plan is that uh, by the end of this year, 
we should be able to start the field trial at least with the bacterial disease uh, in, in Kenya. Uh, so our approach is very much similar to what James is doing. So, you know, we are trying to uh, identify the targets um, uh, mainly in, in the based on the information um, uh, from the uh, progenitors of bananas, like the wild type, um, wild type uh, bananas. And then we transfer that information into the susceptible cultivated varieties. So either we knock out uh, the susceptibility genes, once we identify the susceptibility genes, we knock out, we are actually testing, um, uh, tons of susceptibility genes. Uh, we are also trying to knock out individually or also sometimes uh, knocking out multiple susceptible genes uh, together. And then the second approach is like, we are also trying to overexpress the defense genes. Like if you, we know the, the R genes, but you know, maybe the R, R genes are present, but they are not expressed um, in enough quantity to, de to develop the resistance. So we are overexpressing those uh, defense genes um, into the susceptible uh, varieties. Um, we are working very closely with uh, our breeding program. So IATA has this project on accelerated breeding of better bananas. So uh, we, um, and there are, as IATA is working with a lot of partners on that project. And so that information for the TR4, which is because that project was working on TR4 for, for a few, few years. So the information which is available from that project is actually is now fed in into my program and we are actually validating the disease resistance genes which are identified under under those uh, those program um, and and uh, and then the second approach as i explained we are also developing the the tr4 resistance this is like by knocking down um, the candidate susceptibility or susceptible genes using crispr cas and then this is the product actually which will be um, uh, will be the non non GMO because we are trying to deliver that in, in a DNA free uh, uh, fashion. Um, then the up regulation we are also trying to do the up regulation of some of these R genes, but also some of the antimicrobial protein. There we are we are either doing it with single or multiple, and then we are using the CRISPR activation tool where we modulate the transcriptional activation. Um, domain and we have uh, some good result there by showing we can actually enhance the expression from two to tenfold. Um, but we haven't started uh, the glass house screening yet. So we have only uh, uh, reached up to the level of the enhancing uh, the expression. But then these products, if the product will come out from here, this product will be actually similar uh, to the GM. And the important thing what we are doing is like we are trying to integrate the gene additive and uh, uh, CRISPR Cas based gene um, editing into the into our breeding program. So we are actually uh, working very closely with the breeders, improving um, uh, the parents um, so that you know uh, the it, it, the the gene editing can become the integral part of the of the breeding. Um, and 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 in that way, you know the okay. So the whatever is it, if even though if the foreign gene are getting integrated, we can segregate out um, later on during the uh, in the program. And then <laughs> another aim here is that you know we are also. Uh, trying to do the stacking of the multiple traits, you know, uh, so the TR4, but then uh, in addition to TR4, it can be for the nutrition enhancement for the other resistance to the other diseases as well, uh, like BXW, because Cavendish is also very susceptible to the Xanthomonas well disease. So when we do, when we talk about the the gene additive product, basically there there is a biosafety concern there. So one is the unwanted genetic changes in the plants due to the off-target mutations. So off-target mutations can be minimized by, because by if we start from the improving the gu uh, guide RNA um, at the starting and also the delivery method, if you use 
the DNA free approaches, you can minimize. But then in the end, when you have the product, you can do the whole genome sequencing to rule out any any off target uh, uh, mutation uh, there. The second the second concern is the transgene integration. So to avoid that, uh, we use the DNA free uh, genome editing. Uh, and in the DNA free, actually, we are using the similar approach as, as James was explaining, using the protoplast. Um, and then also we are trying to develop some other, other approaches apart from the CRISPR Cas to develop the DNA free uh, 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 genome edited approaches. Or you can also, if there is, uh, we are using the parents, so you can back cross and then segregate the transgene out um, and just, just retain with the, with the mutation. So that's the another approach we can use it. So just briefly uh, giving you some overview of the legislation for genome editing. Um, so uh, in like the first time in 2015, uh, Argentina developed the first regulation in the world for the gene edited product. And like if the gene edited um, crops, um, the, if there is no foreign gene integration in them, they are not regulated as GMOs. So if you look at this map, all the countries which are highlighted in green, uh, these are the countries where the gene edited crops with no foreign gene integration are not regulated as GMOs. In Africa, um, Nigeria has approved the guideline last year, and so they are the first African country um, where the they have clear guideline for the gene edited product. But then there are several other right, countries uh, uh, which are um, uh, which are actually developed. Uh, um, um, the guidelines and Kenya is actually quite advanced and only the, the countries which are in red, these are the countries where the genome edited crops are actually treated similar to the, to the GMOs. So this is my final slide. Um, key take home messages is that the application of gene editing tool has potential to develop the TR4 um, resistant banana. Um, CRISPR-Cas has rapidly become the most popular gene edited uh, ad approach due to its simplicity, uh, efficiency, um, is specificity, and easy to adopt. Uh, the gene edited crops with uh, no foreign gene integration are not regulated as GMOs in several countries. And at IATA, we have shown the application of CRISPR-Cas based gene edited uh, for developing the disease resistant uh, bananas, particularly for the virus and the bacterial resistance, we have already the proof of, of concept. So in the end, I would like to acknowledge uh, the, the, uh, my team, uh, the bioinformatics team, the breeding group, and also the partners uh, uh, of, uh, like from the University of Queensland, Bear, uh, Wageningen University, and the financial support from USCID, C uh, CGIR research program, and Bear. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Tripathi, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Uh, I'd like now to pass the floor to um, Dr. Eddie Kayat. I wonder if you would like to share your screen. Doctor, should I do it for you? No, uh, I can share my screen, no problem. As you consider it appropriate. Okay. okay, then I will provide a brief uh, introduction for you while you share your screen. Dr. Eli Kayat is the scientific director of Raham Meristem and retired professor of the Hebrew uh, University of Jerusalem. He holds a PhD in plant uh, biochemistry and has more than 30 years of experience with plant research. Dr. Kayat holds several patents on uh, improved varieties and technologies and has developed a method for development of TR4 resistant banana varieties based on in vitro mutagenesis. Rahan Meristem is an agrobiotech company specialized in propagation and breeding of bananas and plantains by tissue cultures. Dr. Kayat will present the role of in vitro mutagenesis in TR4 resistant in Cavendish bananas. Dr. Kayat, thank you very much for your participation. You have the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Victor. And thank you very much uh, to uh, the organizers for inviting me to uh, present our work. So uh, I will start by saying that uh, the background of uh, uh, our work was uh, on uh, a variety called GAL. We are using also now uh, a, a second variety that. Uh, will be shown in this presentation as well. And GAL is a very 
well-known variety for uh, uh, many banana uh, growers throughout the world, anywhere from uh, Australia to uh, Costa Rica and uh, uh, the, the Latin America everywhere. Uh, it's really uh, our best variety and our clients are very happy with this variety. So this was used as a background. Okay, uh, one second. Yeah, so I, I would like to start uh, my uh, presentation with uh, showing uh, the different levels of uh, validation that we did to prove that uh, the varieties that we are uh, producing are really resistant varieties. So the levels of uh, validation start with uh, a molecular uh, proof of uh, induced mutagenesis. So we show molecularly that uh, the induction was performed. Uh, the next step was uh, to show in uh, an ex vitro uh, uh, state where we took the plants to uh, a greenhouse inoculation experiment at the University of Wageningen at uh, the group of uh, Professor Kema and uh, Dr. Fernando Garcia was uh, the person that to perform uh, his uh, screening experiment. The, the next level of uh, uh, validation was uh, a comparison between the wild type and uh, the mutated uh, uh, variety. And that was done uh, on a whole genome sequencing. And I will show some of this evidence. Finally, we did a field trial uh, in three places uh, in, in, in the Philippines uh, in very uh, in highly contaminated uh, areas that uh, areas that uh, previous to this experiment, really all the plants uh, died from uh, fusarium wilt. Uh, the final step is uh, in preparation. We are taking the plants or the clones that we have selected to uh, La Guajira in uh, Colombia, and we have the approval, and we would like to uh, to send our appreciation to ICA and uh, Agrosavia that uh, allowed us to uh, perform this experiment. In La Guajira is the area that uh, was uh, detected as. Uh, uh, contaminated in uh, Colombia. So the plants are already in Colombia. They are being uh, propagated now and they are tested by ICA for uh, uh, other diseases, uh, possibly uh, viruses and so on. And so uh, in the second quarter of uh, 2022 this year, they will be planted uh, in the field. But as I said, they already been tested in the Philippines for more than a hundred weeks of uh, testing. And I will show the results. So being a uh, commercial company, we also were very careful to show that uh, all the yield components are not uh, affected by the mutations. And also the fruit quality is not, uh, uh, it does not have a downside to it. So uh, all of the parameters uh, of the yield and fruit quality were measured uh, in all of the experiments. And I will show how the experiment was designed. So we all know uh, the very common mutations in uh, Cavendish, uh, starting from the dwarf mutation over here and uh, the, this is a little bit more rare, but uh, a lot of times we see uh, pigmentation on the leaves. We see uh, this uh, mutant, which is, a, I call it the narrow, uh, long and narrow leaf compared to the, to the wild type. We see the Masada uh, mutation, which is really a very strange uh, mutant because uh, the number of chromosomes is uh, 34 instead of 33. And also you can see that the, the arrangement uh, of uh, uh, the stomach is different. Uh, it's really not like the wild type, which is in straight lines, like all the monocot uh, plants, but here it's really dispersed all over the leaf. 
So taking that into account, uh, we started with uh, uh, the, our elite clone, which is uh, the GAL clone. And we performed an in vitro mutagenesis, which I will show uh, how we did it. And uh, we, did, uh, we, we did it in uh, tissue culture and we used uh, many, many generations of tissue culture. And we also used uh, TDZ, which is a, a strong cytokinin in order to activate cell division very, very quickly. And we did it on a very small, uh, on very small meristems in order to uh, activate uh, uh, the mutations in uh, the in the in, in the very uh, high, highest part of the uh, meristem, if you want, the stem cells of the meristem. Okay, so we in the final uh, step of the uh, tissue culture, we divided the, the population into uh, uh, three parts. This is each cluster that was developed in the last uh, uh, step of the tissue culture was uh, divided into three parts and we call it uh, siblings. So one uh, set of siblings was sent for the greenhouse uh, inoculation and selection in Wachningen. The second set and the third set were sent to two different parts of uh, uh, two different fields in order to perform at the same time that we are finishing up uh, the work. Uh, we we uh, looked at different phenotypes, especially agro, uh, uh, agronomical uh, phenotypes uh, like uh, the, the components of yield and uh, uh, the, the quality of the fruit. Finally, uh, we will see a little bit uh, uh, what we did with uh, whole genome analysis. And here we compared the wild type to uh, the mutants. Okay, so the way we perform the mutagenesis is by activation of retrotransposable elements. These are elements that exist in the genome in very large parts, especially in bananas. Bananas are known to have uh, high levels of uh, retrotransposable elements. And uh, we activated uh, the, the transcription of this uh, uh, retrotransposable element and the amplification of these elements in the genome by simply demethylation of uh, DNA. And I will show the compound that we used in vitro to demethylate the DNA, or in essence, what we did is uh, we inhibited the enzyme, the methyl transferase, that uh, uh, is responsible for methylation uh, in mitosis during cell division. So these are three different types of uh, 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 transposons, but uh, the, uh, uh, this is class two transposons that we did not uh, uh, bother to use and class uh, heltron, heltron uh, transposons that we also did not bother to use. So uh, we use the class one retro transposable elements that undergo uh, transcription, translation, reintegration into the genome. And by reintegrating into the genome, they cause mutations. So this is a Southern blot uh, using this compound AZA which is a compound that does exactly what I described. It inhibits the enzyme that uh, uh, is responsible for methylation of DNA. So using this uh, uh, compound in the tissue culture, you can see before using the compound, this is uh, uh, um, uh, the Southern blot. And we used as a probe, a small part from a retro element. So you can see that the retro elements exist in the genome. But you can see that after the uh, induction uh, with uh, de demethylation of the uh, of the uh, uh, sorry of demethylation of the meristems, you can see that new bands uh, appeared in the genome, and these new bands were analyzed by us, and these new bands are uh, mutations that appear in the uh, in the chromosomes. Uh, either uh, in existing uh, uh, parts of the uh, parts of the chromosomes where had uh, in the past uh, small amounts of uh, retrotransposable elements, or new areas in the chromosomes where landing pads are now uh, newly being created 
in the in, in the chromosomes. Uh, this is the structure of uh, a retrotransposable element, which is uh, very uh, similar to uh, retroviruses that exist in many uh, uh, species of uh, plants and animals. Okay, so in essence, what we did is we used uh, our uh, technology to create a library of mutants in tissue culture. And uh, we created uh, this library, which, which uh, we can show that each individual plant is somewhat different uh, from his uh, uh, siblings by having uh, uh, these retrotransposable elements being amplified either at the different levels or in different positions in, in the chromosomes. So this is clear and very easy uh, to see because we get different patterns uh, when we use uh, our uh, uh, DNA uh, 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 hybrid. So uh, when we use the uh, southern blots, we can see different uh, uh, patterns and we choose the pattern that is uh, uh, best for us to uh, conform the resistance, which was pre-studied. So here is a, 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 an experiment that was done by uh, Fernando, which I mentioned before at uh, Wageningen University to demonstrate that uh, the screening uh, uh, method is really very reliable and uh, very effective. So you can see that this is uh, one of our uh, Cavendish uh, developed uh, uh, cultivars. It's called Adi, it's a dwarf Cavendish, it's a dwarf cultivar. And you can see that if you infect it with uh, TR4, you can see the infection very clearly. Uh, same with Granen and other Cavendish, and the same with Gros Michel, uh, uh, which also is uh, uh, not tolerant. It's uh, very susceptible to uh, uh, TR4. Now, if we use, if we inoculate the plants, or Fernando inoc inoculated the plants with uh, race one, that you can see here that uh, the Cavendish varieties were uh, white, they did not get infected, while the Gros Michel, which is uh, uh, susceptible to, uh, gross, uh, to uh, TR4, is uh, uh, infected. So that, this gave us uh, uh, the, the, the direction that we really were looking for, that really this system that uh, were, was uh, developed at the University of Wageningen can be used very effectively uh, in our uh, experimental system, and uh, we let them uh, do perform the, the selection. So in uh, the first batch of uh, selection, uh, we gave on uh, our GAL uh, material, we saw that uh, from approximately a uh, little bit less than 10,000 plants, we saw about 8.4% uh, of the plants, which is 415 plants, were what we call, or what uh, Fernando would call uh, asymptomatic. In other words, they did not show the symptoms that I showed in the previous slide. So here is more. Uh, you can see the, the, the entire plants uh, in, the, uh, in, in the greenhouse. And you can see that most of the plants uh, showed symptoms and the symptoms were internally. And also you can see it on the leaves externally. And, but uh, these plants had no symptoms and uh, these were the ones that were selected and repropagated in a lab in, in the Netherlands. And then uh, the plants were transported uh, to the Philippines. So following the, 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 the the, the experiments that were done in the Netherlands and the, also the, the propagation of each one of the clones, we performed a field experiment, which we took from each clone, we propagated approximately 120 plants and dispersed them in, in a field that was previously, as I said before, heavily contaminated with TR4. Actually, we did it first in two areas and now it is in three areas uh, all the same clones giving us exactly the same results. And you can see that the level of resistance is very high, but I want to mention here that 
we really were very careful uh, not to use plants that perhaps will have tolerance to the disease. So even 99.5% of the plants that are uh, resistant, we did not like. We liked only clones that had over, now it's over hundred weeks in the field. Okay, so it's uh, uh, like uh, more than uh, uh, two years or approximately two years uh, with zero infection, absolutely zero infection from each one of the clones. If we had one plant that was infected, the entire clone was discarded. So here you can see the, the wild types or uh, the, the control plants that all were infected. And this is the, uh, the plants that uh, stayed in the field with no infection. You can see the bunches are normal. This is a normal gal. We made all the measurements, which you will see uh, in, in my uh, next slide. All the measurements showed that the, the, all, all of the other parameters that are important to the growers are exactly, exactly like gal. It's a perfect, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a perfect uh, uh, variety. Okay, we also, uh, in the next step, we chose, we made sure to take only clones that were surrounded by controls that all died. So the red dots represent plants that died from uh, TR4 and the 8794 is one example uh, uh, of a clone that survived despite the fact that the approximately two and a half meters from it, there were, uh, or several plants that uh, uh, died, completely died and were infected by the disease. By the way, many people came to the field trials and saw our field trials from everywhere in the world. Many of the banana growers in, from Central America and uh, South America came to see these field trials in their own eyes. Okay, so looking at the parameters of uh, uh, the, the other parameters of uh, uh, compared to uh, uh, to the to the gal, so it, it is really exactly like the gal. There is no difference uh, in any of the parameters. And here, I'm not going to go into details. We have we don't have enough time, but it is exactly like a gal. There is no difference whatsoever. No significant difference, anyways. So looking at the whole genome sequence, uh, very interestingly, we found one locus uh, where the, there was a, a new landing pad that is exactly in the center of a cluster of our genes. So our explanation is, and uh, of course uh, we, we did not prove it as yet, but our explanation is that uh, with so many uh, uh, um, with so many sequences of uh, uh, these uh, transposable elements, with so many fragments of these elements, really we change the conformation of, uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the chromatin at that position. And by changing the conformation of the chromatin, we allow transcription factors or all kinds of uh, other elements uh, uh, to uh, transcribe genes that perhaps in the past were silenced. So this is one example. We have uh, other examples and actually uh, we're doing a lot of bioinformatics now on uh, the comparison of uh, the resistant uh, and the wild type. Yeah, so, Dr. Kayat, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We, we, we used already 20 minutes and I see that you still have four slides. I would really appreciate for the sake of you know allowing the other panelists to to also provide their presentations, if you can uh, perhaps uh, I, I will need another two, two minutes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Apologies. Okay, so this is case two on a uh, on a on a variety that is called Valerie, uh, doing exactly the same experiment. Uh, this is a Valerie that uh, using this uh, uh, technology we made it shorter because Valerie is a very tall. Uh, 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 mutant, uh, I mean Cavendish. And here again at the, the University of Wageningen, this time we put two plants in a pot 
And we only chose part that one plant died and one plant uh, stayed alive and was not infected, was completely uh, 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 or asymptomatic as we call it. And this will go, all, all of these uh, plants will go again, as I said, to La Guajira, both from both experiments. We have uh, the authorization from ICA and uh, uh, AgroSavia and the government of uh, Colombia to use this uh, field in order to validate our results. I just want to thank my group and uh, also our uh, people in uh, our laboratory, uh, uh, both laboratories in Colombia and uh, in the Philippines. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kayat. Very interesting information provided. I'd like now to uh, pass the screen to Mateus Lima to uh, ask uh, two questions, one per panelist. Uh, we, we are a bit late. We'll see we have some time available after the last uh, panelist. Um, so, um, Mateus, please, you have the screen. Thank you, Victor, and thank you for our panelists for the very interesting presentations. We select uh, one question for each panelist, as mentioned by Victor. First to Dr. Dale. Dr. Dale, uh, there is a question asking, what is the gene, gene editing efficiency, the proportion of positive transformation using CRISPR-Cas? You mentioned that not all plants are transformed, so there is this question asking if there is a proportion. Hey, Ellie, happy for you to answer my question. Um, okay, the efficiency, what we're finding, and, and so this is quite important, um, is that uh, now that we're doing uh, practical editing for, for particularly knocking out or down-regulating susceptibility genes. Um, if we get uh, 20 regenerants, uh, remember there's no selection in process here, uh, 20 regenerants, about a third of them are, um, are edited. And of that third, uh, more than half of those uh, appear to be completely uh, DNA free, so it's a it's a real it's a relatively efficient uh, protocol. Go ahead, Matheus. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dale. The other question now we have to Dr. Eli Kayaf is how it can be ensured that plants sent to be tested in different countries, such as the one you mentioned that will be tested uh, in Colombia, are free of diseases such as viruses and other important diseases that can pose dangers to the production of the country. Okay, so we, uh, we, uh, we are working under supervision uh, in Colombia, of course, of the uh, ICA, which is the phytosanitary authorities of uh, Colombia. And we are doing the same thing we will do in uh, uh, Ecuador. So we already have uh, the agreement of the, uh, of the country of Ecuador to, uh, uh, so they will, the plants will be quarantined and uh, they will be tested for a bunch of top virus and the other viruses, banana brack, mosaic virus and uh, the other diseases as well. Um, as far as we know, uh, uh, fungi do not overcome the tissue culture process that was, uh, 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 that was proven uh, in Australia and in Costa Rica and by us and by many groups. So there would be uh, really, uh, it's almost impossible that uh, there would be any uh, TR4, but uh, the plants are all tested for that. Uh, okay, so they are all diagnosed for all these diseases. Thank okay, you very thank much. You. Sorry, please, Victor, go. No, mm -hmm, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dale, Dr. Kayat, for the excellent uh, presentations. Now, um, I'm mindful of the time, so I would like to continue with the next uh, block, the next section on obstacles and opportunities for banana cultivar diversification. We have uh, Miguel, I'm going to switch to Spanish maybe uh, now uh, for interpreters to know, to change the, the, the channel and, and also for um, English speakers. Now um, we will move to Spanish, so you need to switch uh, your channel into English in order to receive the English version. 
Eh, don Miguel Dita, tenemos, eh, la, tenemos exactamente 41 minutos. Eh, quizás Raisa puede proveer las conclusiones finales en cinco minutos. Tenemos entonces eh, 30-35 minutos, un poquito menos de lo que habíamos calculado. Habíamos pensado que la presentación fuera 20 minutos. Digo esto porque podemos seguir con esa presentación de 20 minutos, pero la sesión de preguntas y respuestas tendrá que reducirse un poquito. Entonces, eh, Perdón, el doctor eh, don Miguel Ángel Dita Rodríguez es científico principal del Alliance Biodiversity International y CIA. Y CIA. Tiene un doctorado en eh, fitopatología por la Universidad Federal de, de Visosa y tiene más de 20 años de experiencia liderando proyectos de investigación en todo el mundo. Su amplia experiencia radica en el desarrollo de herramientas de diagnóstico, el diseño de planes de contingencia para respuestas rápidas y coordinadas a plagas y enfermedades emergentes. Además, como la integración de enfoques positivos eh, para la naturaleza de, de la salud de las plantas en Baranos. El señor Dita presentará eh, obstáculos y oportunidades para la diversificación de, eh, de, de plantas y cultivares del Barano. Don Miguel, creo que estás con nosotros. Sí, gracias Víctor. ¿Me puedes dar, por favor, permiso para compartir mi pantalla? Por supuesto. Adelante. Ok, me avisen, por favor, cuando vean mi pantalla, si está ya full. Ahora está full. Bienvenido, muchas gracias. Ok, muchísimas gracias Víctor por la invitación. También a todos los colegas que... Que, que se han conectado de diferentes partes del mundo, me han saludado, muchos saludos a, a todos, espero que estén bien. También gracias a, a los panelistas que, que, que han hecho un brillante trabajo, en realidad yo me, me, me lo he disfrutado muchísimo. El desafío que tenemos un poco nosotros es intentar eh, hacer un resumen, un poco, una visión un poco crítica de cuáles son los desafíos, obstáculos, oportunidades para la diversificación de variedades en banano y... Y para empezar, yo creo que es importante entender cómo está eh, hoy la cadena de, de, de bananos en términos de exportación. Si estamos hablando de, de diversificar el portafolio de variedades de banano a través de los canales de exportación, tenemos que entender que, que esto hace parte de una cadena que es multiactores, multiintereses y que es, es bastante compleja. ¿sí? Y que en el día de hoy, o sea, es realmente eh, orientada hacia acá. Si sí, las variedades que se vengan al mercado residente a las cuatro tropicales son del tipo Cavendish, pues esa diversificación de esos tipos de Cavendish pues no tendría mayor, mayor problema, porque, porque, pero si no lo son, sí tendríamos problemas. No tendría mayor problema, digo, porque realmente cuando, cuando vemos el mundo hoy gira y va cambiando, pero hace muchos años, más de 60, ¿verdad?, que Cavendish se mantiene en los, en los cinco continentes, o sea, que, que, que ese es una, un desafío enorme que tendremos si no tenemos variedades que son del tipo carnes. Habiendo dicho esto, ¿sí? Habiendo dicho esto, yo creo que podríamos entonces entrar a discutir básicamente estos cinco puntos. La parte de desarrollo de variedades, que ya ha sido tocado por muchos de los colegas que presentaron. La parte de propiedad intelectual. La parte de ese proceso de importación, de evaluación en campo. Luego de esa, que ya se tengan las variedades a multiplicación a larga escala y de distribución, que no son siempre procesos juntos. Lógicamente, nosotros tenemos que hacer a lo largo de, de, de esta presentación un poco de consideraciones de, de qué nuevas variedades implican para los sistemas de producción y mercado. Y nosotros, como CISJAR, tenemos también un poquito que, que, que decir cuál puede ser nuestro granito de arena. Sí, bueno, empezando inicialmente por el desarrollo de cultivar. Yo creo que aquí hay cinco puntos importantes no se trata apenas de buscar esa bala de plata que nos vaya a salvar como fue el Cavendish eh, para Gros Michel. ¿sí? Hay diferentes eh, herramientas, necesidades, regulaciones, ya esas fueron discutidas. Hasta ahora lo que hay en mercado, vamos a discutir más en detalle, es, son variedades que son tolerantes o parcialmente resistentes y eso hace falta un poco que se entienda mejor qué esto implica. ¿sí? Porque ahí me lleva al tercer punto, que es este que está aquí, que, que el negocio cuando se plantan variedades que no son totalmente resistentes, pues cambia, cambia un poco. Aquí, ayer ya se discutió un poco, el doctor Adolfo de, de, de FIA lo mencionó, las oportunidades que hay para otras variedades, y, y aquí 
para nosotros también es muy importante que, que, que tengamos, o sea, asegurar que, que aquellos pequeños productores, sobre todo los pequeños, pues no se quedan atrás, que tienen también acceso a estas nuevas variedades que eh, van a ser desarrolladas o que ya están desarrolladas o que están en proceso. ¿sí? Aquí rápidamente eh, tenemos que estar claros. La única alternativa que hay, hasta donde sabemos, hasta lo que fue presentado aquí comercialmente disponible, es, son estos, estos clones eh, o sumaclones GCTV 218, como sana, que son... Eh, tolerantes o parcialmente resistentes. Aquí hay tres preguntas que están en el interior de su pantalla, no los voy a, no los voy a discutir porque se han discutido en, en otras presentaciones, eh, pero básicamente eh, lo que nos preocupa un poco, creo que a todos, es esta cuestión de otras enfermedades, esta cuestión de nuevas razas, sobre todo la cuestión de, del sistema de producción de, de monocultivo intensivo. Pero regresando a, a, a las variedades que son parcialmente resistentes, tolerantes, como se quieran llamar, yo creo que las presentaciones ayer fueron muy claras, el doctor Altus fue muy claro en esto, en que es una resistencia que es cuantitativa, ¿sí? que ella sí, en determinado momento, con menores niveles, pero se, se, se enferman. ¿sí? El, el doctor Altus también mencionó, no son inmunes, inmunes quiere decir, para aquel colega que preguntó, que, que no es el mismo caso de Cavendish, para raza 1, ¿sí? Estamos acostumbrados a Cavendish para raza 1, lo que estas variedades eh, tienen es eh, sin un nivel de resistencia, esa es la única alternativa que tenemos, pero, pero tienen mm, ese, ese, esa característica. Y aquí es muy importante, que, que yo creo que es el punto número 2, que, que se necesitan programas de entrenamiento fuerte para que los productores entiendan cómo se manejan esas enfermedades. Y ahí, o sea, esas, esas variedades, esos homoclones, que probablemente algunos que van a llegar al mercado tengan ese tipo de resistencia también, ¿Cómo se manejan? ¿sí? ¿Cuáles son lo, 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 las cosas que cambian? Y aquí las experiencias en Mozambique y las, las experiencias en, 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 en Filipinas que se fueron presentadas ayer son súper, súper importantes. Tenemos que entender también que, que hay un riesgo, sí, para la diseminación de patógenos, ya sea a, a cortas o a largas distancias, a través también de material de siembra. Y eso lo voy a tocar un poquito después cuando toque los otros temas. Esto se habló un poquito ayer. Probablemente lo que viene en términos de, de diversificación de variedades, un portafolio de Cavendish o casi Cavendish que está llegando, pues se está trabajando fuerte en eso y lógicamente tenemos esos desafíos que, que, que yo mencioné anteriormente, esos tres que están allá abajo, el doctor Eli también lo mencionó, como si la toca negra, etc. Y, y, y aquí un poco lo que está pasando con los límites máximos de residuos y las otras plagas que están saliendo con cambio climático, sobre todo plagas, eh, insectos, plagas, de racimos, ¿verdad? Que no podemos olvidarnos de esto. Hay un tema que lo voy a tocar rápidamente, que es el tema de cambio climático en relación a sequía o estrés hídrico. ¿Sí? Es algo que nos está afectando mucho más y ojalá que dentro de todo este, este proceso también estas cuestiones de, 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 de cambio climático, de, 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 de agua sobre todo, sean consideradas. A mí me gustó mucho también la presentación que hizo el doctor Adolfo ayer sobre la diversificación, la oportunidad que hay para otras variedades. Sí, hay, hay, hay oportunidades para otras variedades y ojalá que poco a poco, sabemos que hay una presión muy fuerte para, para, para resolver el problema de Cavendish, pero que esas otras variedades que eventualmente eh, también son resistentes, o oh, disculpen, también son susceptibles de raza 4 tropical, eh, sean también de, de alguna manera atendidas, porque hay nichos para esas variedades, muchos productores en diferentes países que también las usan y son súper importantes para el comercio local y también para, para seguridad alimentaria, que es mucho más importante. ¿sí? Básicamente, si resumimos esa parte, hay aún muchas variedades de, de, de banano a otras. Aquí he puesto tres, los Michel y Odito, que están esperando también una luz al final del túnel para vencer esa batalla contra raza 4 tropical. El segundo tema que quería abordar era el tema de propiedad intelectual. Es un tema un poco más delicado, no es una especialidad nuestra, pero aquí quería llamar la atención para estos tres puntos principales. Ese proceso de negociación inicial, y he puesto aquí lenguaje. Lenguaje aquí no es solamente eh, la cuestión de idioma, ¿eh? que uno habla inglés o otro español, el lenguaje que se usa para la negociación, esos procesos, a veces no está muy claro, y se necesita en determinado momento un soporte legal, de, de, sobre todo inclusive en las leyes de recursos genéticos de los países. A veces eso no está claro. En segundo punto, lo las regulaciones que tienen las organizaciones nacionales de protección fitosanitaria, las capacidades que tienen instaladas los países, que son asimétricas también, y luego la agilidad que se cuentan entre esos procesos para atender las necesidades o a veces deseos del, del sector productivo. 
lógicamente, como ya he dicho al principio, ese acceso de estos nuevos clones, nuevas variedades que tienen patente y todo, de los pequeños productores, es algo que necesita ser discutido de, desde un inicio. ¿sí? Esto me lleva al tercer punto. Supongamos que tenemos la variedad que se, llama, se va a importar un país, y, y hay un ejemplo interesante que el doctor Eli mencionó sobre lo que se ha avanzado en Colombia, pero aquí me parece que hay, hay tres puntos cuando miramos de manera global, y a veces yo me siento un poco más en América Latina y Caribe, porque es con donde yo estoy, y aquí yo he, he, he listado cinco puntos. He puesto uno, el proceso de, 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 de cuarentena post-entrada, ¿sí? eh, los roles institucionales, cuál es el rol, por ejemplo, de la Organización Nacional Fitosanitaria, la ONPF, cuál es el rol del Instituto de Investigación. ¿Sí? ¿Qué facilidades hay, por ejemplo, para aclimatar esas plantas en los países y para cumplir con los requisitos de cuarentena? Número tres, ¿qué capacidades existen para hacer un diagnóstico o un indexado multi, multipatógenos? Ya se tocó un poquito el tema. Diferentes virus, por ejemplo, hay capacidades para el BTV, para Banana Bunchstock Virus, hay capacidades, por ejemplo, para el virus de la vaca, todo ese tipo de cosas, hay un poco que revisarlas, ir adelantándolas para cuando llegue el tiempo a cada país de llegar a esta fase número 3. La otra parte que hemos puesto aquí es la parte de auditorías, control de calidad. O sea, ¿cuántas plantas se muestran? Lo vamos a discutir rápidamente. Y al final, cuando llega esa, esa liberación de ese cultivar para, para las evaluaciones en campo, también ese proceso a veces no está muy claro en, en algunos países. Aquí, por ejemplo, y es una preocupación que, que tenemos en la región, ya la gente lo menciona, es importante, eh, eh, cuando se hace el proceso de importación, eh, por ejemplo, el banana bullshit virus, yo he puesto aquí como big, big threat virus, para que la gente entienda que esto es realmente es una gran amenaza, por lo menos para América Latina y Caribe. ¿Por qué? Pues porque todavía nosotros somos región libre, la enfermedad ha incrementado bastante. Hay artículos recientes de los colegas del, del IITA eh, eh, mostrando esto. Nuestra región es todavía libre pero en nuestra región sí está el vector que es pentadonia migromelosa. Eso lo venimos repitiendo, yo creo, a partir de la mitad del año pasado, porque realmente es un riesgo que no debemos, no debemos olvidar. Aquí es importante también, yo creo, que aquí es un poquito el granito de arena que podemos poner nosotros, que es que hay experiencia para la introducción y el movimiento seguro del hemoplasma, hay guías que se pueden adaptar, ahí está el, el, el International Transit Center en Bélgica, que tiene muchísima experiencia. Más de 110 países, más de 300 usuarios, enviando material de siembra o material de, de, de o sea, germoplasma, para ponerlo de esa manera, de manera segura. Entonces, quizás ahí se podría un poco aprovechar de esa experiencia que tiene ITC y ver cómo, cómo, cómo se integra todo este proceso. ¿sí? El otro punto, que no solamente en África, eh, o sea, disculpen, en, en, en Europa, nosotros también en América Latina y Caribe, ahora con esta alianza Biodiversity International CIAT, eh, en marzo se debe inaugurar el edificio que se llama Semillas del Futuro. Yo creo que, que tenga más interés nos po podemos conversar, pero hay una oportunidad grande también para que dentro de esta experiencia que tiene CIA, que CIA también tiene una unidad de fitosanidad de germoplasma, ¿sí? poder también aprovechar todas esas experiencias, todas esas capacidades para que tengamos, por lo menos en América Latina y Caribe, eh, eh, esas capacidades o aprovechar de la experiencia que ya existe. En el otro punto, voy a tomar dos preguntas de, de la sesión de ayer, que, fue, que fueron recurrentes hoy también un poco, y le agradezco a Rafael y a Luis por hacerlas a, a ayer, y tienen que ver que cómo reaccionan eh, estas variedades en, en, bajo, en la agricultura de bajos insumos, en periodos de sequías prolongados, cuál es la respuesta a otras enfermedades, etc. Eso me lleva al, al cuarto punto, que es súper importante, que es el punto de evaluación en campo. Estamos hablando aquí de campo, ¿sí? Aquí, tres puntos fundamentales. Los ensayos multisitios, en diferentes sitios, ¿sí? Lo que se resolvió en Filipinas va a funcionar en Perú, o, o lo, lo que funcionó en Perú, por ejemplo, en Piura, va a funcionar en, 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 en por ejemplo, en Selva Central, o en Colombia, etc. Es importante esos sitios, esos, esos ensayos multisitios, porque las condiciones ambientales son diferentes, lo vamos a ver pero sobre todo también porque hay dos escenarios aquí, si lo probamos en un inicio en áreas afectadas por la secuela tropical y también en áreas que son libres, ¿para qué? Para estudiar las características morfoagronómicas de producción, etc. Hay un punto importante que el doctor Eli también lo mencionó, que es la parte de tener protocolos que sean confiables, repetibles y que se puedan comparar también, ¿sí? Y aquí el, 
ayer fue discutido un poco también sobre si se usa inóculo artificial, si es mucho, si se usa solo inóculo natural, si se usan dos, y si se usa inóculo natural, ¿cómo garantizar que esas plantas que sobreviven estaban realmente en contacto con una cantidad suficiente? Que eso es otro aspecto de discutir del inóculo, ¿sí? Eso es importante y sobre todo en la parte de evaluación, en aquellos países que la enfermedad todavía bajo, está bajo control oficial, inclusive en aquellos que no también, pero es la cuestión de bioseguridad. Aquí lo que quiero llamar la atención en la parte de evaluación es que de este, de este triángulo famoso de epidemiología de la enfermedad, donde tenemos que tener un, la planta, la verdad, susceptible, el ambiente eh, y el patógeno, nosotros en este seminario estamos mirando apenas una esquina de, 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 de ese triángulo que, que, que es la planta, ¿sí? Tenemos que entender que cuando hablamos de esos ensayos multisitios, estamos hablando de ensayos por patógenos probablemente que puedan tener diferentes comportamientos dependiendo del suelo, del ambiente, etc. Y por eso que es importante hacerlo. Aquí algo que también podríamos eh, aprender de lo que pasó en el pasado, ¿sí? Nosotros en Biodiversity International y CIA, en la Alianza, tra trabajamos con redes y tenemos eh, acciones en, en, en en los tres continentes, en esos tres continentes con tres redes, pero en el pasado también hubo un, un, un programa internacional para evaluación de variedades, que se pueda mejorar, que se pueda revisar, quizás es aprender de lo que se hizo también en el pasado. ¿Quién sabe tener programas regionales para la evaluación y distribución después de esas variedades resistentes? Apenas lo pongo aquí para, para, como una idea, ¿verdad? Luego, hablando de evaluación, para aquellos colegas que no conocen, el año pasado publicamos eh, esta guía, con algunos elementos, estamos hablando de una guía, ¿verdad? No es que queramos decir que esto lo tienen que hacer los países o no, es una guía para que las personas tengan una idea de, de qué parámetros, de qué variables pueden ser utilizados, eh, y no solamente para Fusarium, también está para Sigatoca, y, y algo que nos preocupa mucho, vuelvo a decirlo, que es la cuestión de la, cuestión de, de la seca ¿no? o de la sequía. Esto me lleva entonces ya al punto número 5, que es la multiplicación a larga escala. Ya cuando tienes la variedad, digamos, o tolerante o resistente, o ya que está lista para, para multiplicar y para distribuir. ¿Sí? Estoy yendo un poquito adelante porque esas etapas hay que pasarlas. Aquí hay tres puntos importantes que me gustaría analizar. El primero es certificación. ¿sí? Certificación de material libre de enfermedades versus las capacidades nacionales. Lo vamos a discutir. El segundo es un poquito del control de calidad. Y aquí voy después quizás a, a, a la parte de... de te de decides, lo voy a explicar en una información. Y lo que existe desde México hasta Argentina, por ejemplo, lo conozco y estoy seguro también en otros continentes también, que es un intercambio informal de material de siembra. Lógicamente, todo esto tiene que ir integrado a los sistemas o los programas nacionales de producción de semilla, entre comillas, limpia, que muchos países sabemos que no lo tienen. Donde quiero llegar es que cuando esta variedad llega, tiene que entrar en el final, esos canales de distribución pasan por estos procesos. Aquí voy a poner un ejemplo, por ejemplo, sabemos que, que, que el cultivo de tejido ¿sí? eh, la, es, debe ser, de, es, 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 la, es, es el material de siembra, la fuente que debe ser utilizada, y lo voy a poner después también, e incentivada. ¿sí? Y cada país tiene sus políticas, sus capacidades, etc. Pero a veces hemos visto que, que las metodologías, por ejemplo, para, 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 para selección, para, para muestrear, o para hacer aquel o aquella diagnóstico, a larga escala para multipatógenos, a veces no, no están disponibles. A veces tenemos situación que ya sí están en los viveros. Y aquí me gustaría enfatizar nuevamente en lo que dije que, um, hace unos minutos. El material de, de cultivo de tejido, o sea, vitro plantas, para muchos países, América tiene que ese término, debe ser recomendado y, 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 e incentivado. Pero recordemos que esto no es una garantía per se de que está libre de enfermedades, porque depende mucho de cómo ese proceso de aclimatización ocurre. Y además de eso, porque después que sale de los viveros, también tienen otros procesos como de transporte, como intermediarios, como de manejo, y, y, y eso no siempre está muy, digamos, alineado o claro en los países. Sabemos que la expectativa que tenemos es esta, que está a mi izquierda, vitroplanta, material de siembra certificado, libre de plagas y enfermedades, pero la realidad que tenemos hasta ahora, por lo menos, es, es muy diferente. Es esta otra que tenemos en la derecha. Y aquí podemos ver un ejemplo de, de cómo sucede esto en campo. Por diferentes, por diferentes motivos. Mi pregunta un poco aquí es que cuando esa variedad resistente o tolerante o, o, esté en un campo y no muestre síntomas y, y, y se sepa que hay una variedad diferente en la región, 
y se hagan de sí, por ejemplo, ¿sí? ¿Qué pasa con esos hijos? Y si no van a entrar entonces en ese canal de distribución informal de material de ciencia. Al final, llegamos a lo que llamamos, a lo que, eh, llegamos a lo que llamamos de la cadena de valores, ¿verdad? Si lo ponen lo en la parte izquierda de su pantalla, es ahí. Nosotros estamos discutiendo un poco hoy esta parte aquí, de sitio específico, mercado, etc. Y aquí hay un flujo que a mí siempre funciona, por ejemplo, los colegas que están en mutación, en crisis, están directamente aquí, otros colegas también están, porque ya pasaron por todo esto, pero estamos aquí. Cuando esa variedad llega, ya se empieza a, a consolidar, y eso lo hemos visto en, en otros países que ya están utilizando nuevas variedades, pues hay muchísimas otras preguntas que hacemos a lo largo de, de la cadena de valores. Ojalá que muchas de ellas sean respondidas para llegar a lo que en teoría soñamos, que son sistemas de producción residentes. En todo este proceso, señores, muchas oportunidades para, para hacer eh, convenios, para hacer integración, para hacer colaboración, porque una variedad, al fin y al cabo, es una variedad, pero tiene que enfrentarse a todo este proceso sin hablar ya lo que mencioné al principio, que es la cadena ya de mercado. Nosotros en la Alianza Biodiversity International CIA, en CGIR, eh, tenemos ese alcance, digamos, como global, tenemos staff en todos esos lugares donde ven esos círculos más oscuros y estamos dispuestos, como siempre hemos trabajado, a crear puentes, a ayudar, a tener proyectos, a, a, a fortalecer capacidades, no solo en América Latina y Caribe, pero también facilitar ese intercambio que tenemos con otros países para desarrollar soluciones basadas en investigación, en datos ¿eh? sólidos para ayudar a que este, este proceso de diversificación de variedades realmente sea, sea un éxito y que nuestros sistemas de producción lleguen a ser realmente más sostenibles. Yo creo que, que como, como, como una reflexión final, yo creo que todo el mundo estamos de acuerdo de que necesitamos más de una, de un solo tipo de, de, de banana. Yo creo que eso ya, ya lo sabemos, pero también yo creo que llegue, tenemos que llegar a, a entender que, que el desarrollo de esa, variana, de esa variedad o de esas variedades es apenas uno de los desafíos que tenemos adelante. Si sí, una pregunta que me gustaría dejar para, para la audiencia es un poco si estamos listos para, para realmente enfrentar este desafío. Con eso me gustaría agradecer realmente a todas las instituciones que, que, que participan con nosotros, los donantes, etcétera. Lo que uno presenta aquí realmente es, es, es el fruto de muchas interacciones, de muchos años, de muchos esfuerzos, muchas veces anónimos y me gustaría realmente agradecer a todos los que colaboran con nosotros y, o, o que no colaboran pero que están trabajando en pro de, de que realmente eh, este problema de raza cuadra tropical y los otros que también, que también vienen en la cadena de banano se han resuelto de la mejor manera posible. Muchísimas gracias por su atención, Víctor, nuevamente, a los colegas, Víctor, nuevamente, gracias a Basta, mi email, si por una cuestión de tiempo no tenemos posibilidad de responder todas las preguntas, por favor, siéntanse libres de contactarme por esa vía. Muchísimas gracias. Perfecto, don Miguel. Como siempre, una... Una presentación excelente, con unos contenidos excelentes. Voy a darle la palabra ahora al señor Mateos Lima para que haga una pregunta y le abrimos la rueda de preguntas eh, quizás durante cinco minutos. Adelante, Mateos. Eh, estimado doctor Miguel, muchísimas gracias por la presentación, muy completa y una visión muy holística del tema. Una pregunta que recibimos es, ¿cuál es el rol de las ONPFs en el movimiento de germoplasmas de banano? con relación a lo que hablaron de, de riesgo de introducción de enfermedades, de cuarentena, etc. Muchas gracias, Miguel. Gracias, Mateo. Sí, yo, yo creo que hay colegas de las ONPFs aquí comentados. Es una pregunta que me parece que cambia un poco de, de país para país. Pero no nos olvidemos que, que para una plaga cuarentenaria, por lo menos para América Latina, bajo control oficial, quien tiene, digamos, eh, la última palabra en todos los movimientos estos es la ONPF. ¿Sí? Entonces, eh, desde la parte de vigilancia y diagnóstico, está bajo, eh, hasta donde yo entiendo, bajo el mandato de las ONPF y hay que seguir estrictamente las regulaciones que, que estas eh, organizaciones tienen. Sí, veo que don Adolfo ha levantado la mano. Don Adolfo, adelante, por favor. Sí, eh, buenos días. Eh, a mí me, gusta, me gustaría hacer un comentario sobre la propiedad de las variedades que se están produciendo tanto en Honduras como Israel, Australia y otros países. 
Eh, veo que la mayor parte de los participantes en este foro son representantes de gobiernos. Y obviamente estas variedades todas van a ser patentadas y todas van a tener pago de regalías. O sea que lo más posible es que no van a estar a disposición de pequeños productores a no ser que algún gobierno o algún ente internacional decida hacerlo. Probablemente las únicas que van a estar disponibles para pequeños productores son las que haga el IITA en África, si es que el IITA lo decide así. Pero en el caso nuestro en FIA, nosotros no podemos. Y yo estoy seguro de que las empresas en Inglaterra, en Israel y en Australia, todos van a querer recuperar los costos de producción de nuevas variedades. El costo nuestro de hacer una variedad es de cerca de 3 millones de dólares. Ese es nuestro costo básico. Y eso después de tener 50, casi 50 años de experiencia y mucha tecnología local y bajos costos de mano de obra en Honduras. O sea que me imagino que nuestra parte va a ser más alta. O sea que siempre, con, no crean que cuando ya hay una variedad solo hacer pedirla. No, no se la van a entregar. Eh, se, va a hacer, se van a tener que patentar, hacer convenios y va a tener todo un costo. Muchas gracias. Muy bien. Don Miguel, no sé si quieres eh, reaccionar a eso, si no, yo tengo alguna pregunta para ti. No, yo creo que Alfonso, Adolfo fue muy claro en eso, por eso yo lo puse un poco, porque hay que ya traer a la discusión, los gobiernos o las agencias que, que realmente van a contribuir con eso, tienen que estar muy, muy claras en lo que mencionó Adolfo, que esto tiene un costo, y estas variedades tienen, sí, por eso es bueno que se vaya discutiendo desde un principio, para que sepan que esto no, esto no va a estar probablemente, como mencionó Adolfo, gratis, o sea, eso, 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 eso tiene pagos reales y hay que estar preparado para eso, pero para no tener sorpresas al final. ¿Tú cómo ves, y esto es una pregunta mía directamente, cómo ves el futuro de la financiación de nuevas variedades o de la continuación con esta investigación, teniendo en cuenta estos temas tan importantes de la propiedad intelectual y que, bueno, pago de regadías, patentes, etcétera? Gracias, Víctor. Es una pregunta exactamente delicada, ¿verdad? Yo, yo como lo veo, nosotros pensábamos, hay que hay iniciativas que ya empezaron, por ejemplo, Adolfo lo mencionó muy bien ayer, ya se están trabajando con empresas, con consorcios privados. Yo creo que, 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 se, que hay espacio todavía para tener consorcios donde, 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 donde se ponga recursos, donde se garantice que esas variedades van a estar accesibles a los pequeños productores. Entonces, ya sean asociaciones, ya sean gobiernos, pero si se crea un consorcio, digamos, donde, que no empiece de cero quizás, pero donde se, donde se junten las fuerzas. Pero al final de cuentas estamos hablando que, que, que Banano emplea eh, millones de trabajadores, ¿sí? Y que esas empresas que exportan y todo, al final de cuentas, Banano son un cultivo que, 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 que requiere muchísima mano de obra. Y sí que es importante, para, inclusive, para la estabilidad social en muchos países. Entonces, hay, hay, hay que tener una discusión bastante seria con esto, con, con, inclusive con las personas que, que entienden procesos legales. Yo no, yo, yo no soy especialista en propiedad intelectual, yo lo he puesto porque me parece que, que, que es algo que, que, que hay que ir discutiendo, pero que poco, en breve, ojalá que más tarde, que, más temprano que nunca, que tarde tengamos variedades disponibles y había que sentarse a negociar. Pero yo, yo, yo creo que hay posibilidades para tener consorcios consorcio para, para, para que estas variedades estén disponibles, pero lógicamente hay que discutir caso a caso ¿Quién, ¿Quién estaría dispuesto a hacerlo de esa manera? Hay, hay que entender también, y hay una cosa que, que yo se lo pongo un poco a, a, a por ejemplo, a, a Adolfo o, o a Lee también. Por ejemplo, eh, vamos a suponer que un productor eh, X que sí le pagó a, 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 a FIA, por ejemplo, eh, le distribuye su material de siembra porque tiene derecho a, a, a productores pequeños que le venden a él. ¿sí? Entonces, ¿qué, ¿qué pasa con eso? Por eso me refería un poquito al control de calidad. ¿Qué pasa con esos hijos de esas plantas una vez que estén en territorio? Eso es un tipo un poco complicado y yo creo que hay que respetar la propiedad intelectual, hay que respetar el trabajo de investigación que se hizo y hay que empezar a discutir y negociar de una manera que no se afecte realmente lo que Adolfo mencionó. Las inversiones que se han hecho en todo este proceso, hay que ser realistas en todo, en todo este proceso e intentar encontrar mecanismos donde, donde que sean ganar-ganar, win-win situations, ¿sí? Entonces... Es, es delicado, pero hay, hay que empezar a discutir. Perfecto, muchas gracias. Sí, la verdad es que el, el tema de pequeños productores y, y productores de media escala 
es un, es un motivo de, de preocupación ¿no? en, este, en estos asuntos. Hay otra pregunta también para, para el señor Dita. Es, eh, fuera de inundaciones, ¿cómo el cambio climático puede afectar la dispersión de fusarión en bananos? ¿Hay alguna organización o institución que esté investigando sobre el efecto y diferentes factores ambientales en la productividad de bananos? Sí, gracias. Es una pregunta excelente. ¿sí? Eh, nosotros hemos hecho algo, ¿sí? hay cosas muy interesantes sobre factores de predisposición a fusarium. Por ejemplo, ahí estábamos discutiendo con unos productores en, en Brasil que está lloviendo muchísimo, no sé si han visto las noticias, inundación y todo esto, pero eh, eh, más allá de la dispersión, eh, en ese momento hay una aceleración de fusarium en muchos casos por condiciones de predisposición, por ejemplo, encharcamiento. Aquí hay que dividir dos cosas. Una, una, una cuestión es dispersión, ¿verdad?, de, de, a través del agua, los canales, etc. La otra parte es factores de predisposición, cómo esa planta está más predispuesta o menos apta para sobrevivir o para enfrentar, digamos, eh, al fusario. Y aquí hemos visto que podría pro, eh, periodos prolongados de seca, pues después por periodos excesivos de lluvia, dispara la enfermedad, y, y, y depende mucho también de las condiciones del suelo, de la de núcleo, etc. Eh, se necesita un mayor estudio, lógicamente, y nosotros siempre decimos que estos estudios tienen que ser sitio específico. Lo que se aplica a veces a un lugar no se aplica al otro. Por ejemplo, en Perú tenemos suelos, en muchos lugares alcalinos, en otros lugares suelos más ácidos, y, y, y es, es, es un multifactorial que, que hay que estudiar. Ahora, si tiene una variedad, digamos que es totalmente inmune, podría, o sea, totalmente resistente, ya eso ayuda mucho, mucho más, como es el caso que hemos tenido con, con Cáñez y Raza 1. Muy bien. Muchas gracias. Estoy consciente del, del tiempo. No sé si Raísa o, o Mateus tienen alguna pregunta más de las 40 preguntas casi que tenemos en, en, en la sección de preguntas y respuestas que, como decimos, responderemos de forma bilateral después. Intentaremos eh, incluso meterlas en, un, en el informe y ver si nuestros panelistas pueden responderlas. Pero no sé si tienen alguna pregunta más eh, antes de pasar a las conclusiones, Mateus y, y Raísa. No, gracias, Víctor. Hay muchas preguntas que yo creo que la idea también es, eh, pues en el informe que hagamos y que vamos a compartir con todos, poder, eh, pidiéndole obviamente el apoyo a los panelistas, dar respuesta a las preguntas que hoy están en el, en el chat. Absolutamente. No sé si a, a, antes de que pasemos, porque estoy viendo que nos quedan todavía nueve minutos, antes de que pasemos al, a las conclusiones finales, no sé si eh, alguno de los panelistas presentes querría eh, comentar con respecto a este último tema, que quizás es también muy importante, ¿no? no solamente la identificación de variedades, sino cómo luego serán esas variedades disponibles para los pequeños productores, medianos. Estoy viendo que don Adolfo está presente en la llamada. Eh, no sé si don Adolfo querría, por ejemplo, dar su opinión al respecto, cómo hace esas variedades disponibles para el público en general. Adelante. Bueno, para el, público, para el público en general, no sé, pero sí le digo que para los socios nuestros lo que se ha pensado es, tenemos tres empresas que están patrocinando el programa. Eh, el programa, como les digo, cuesta aproximadamente un millón de dólares al año. Los híbridos se le han mandado ya a las tres empresas, a Australia, a Guatemala y aquí en Honduras a Dole. Ahora, por lo que hemos hablado, y todavía no tenemos eh, un reglamento bien escrito, eh, es que cada empresa tiene derecho a producir esos híbridos en sus plantaciones, sin restricción. Ahora, si ellos quieren tener, por ejemplo, en el caso de cualquiera de los tres, quieren tener productores asociados, porque estas tres empresas son grandes y las tres mercadean banana. Si ellos quieren tener productores asociados produciendo la misma variedad, ellos le pueden dar el material genético y le van a cobrar por caja de banano producida. Porque van a tener ahorros, en, 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 especialmente inicialmente va a ser en, el gran ahorro en, en el control de cigatoca. El control de cigatoca en América Central puede costar entre mil y dos mil dólares por hectárea. Y si usted se va a ahorrar de eso el 80%, pues es una barbaridad de dinero. Y bien puede pagar 50 centavos de dólar por caja o 60 centavos de dólar por caja para sufragar los gastos que la empresa 
incurrió en el desarrollo del, del híbrido. Y también como FIA es parte de ese arreglo, pues de ese pago, también una parte vendría para FIA, el cual se reinvertiría en el programa y continuaríamos con el mejoramiento genético de otros materiales. Esta es una idea que se ha mencionado. Ahora, la otra es que es el asunto de las patentes. Esto hoy en día, esto habría que patentarlo en todos los países, en uno por uno, y eso es muy caro. Eso es muy caro. Eh, FIA tiene un poco de experiencia patentando variedades en Estados Unidos, en México, eh, solo creo que esos dos países. Y, y en realidad lo hicimos hace varios años solo para aprender cómo se patentaban variedades de banano y plátano, porque en una época no se podía. Ahora sí se puede. Eh, ahora, ¿qué quiere decir que yo tengo una patente de un banano en Estados Unidos y en Estados Unidos no se produce? Bueno, tal vez Hawái, Puerto Rico. Eso quiere decir que si usted lo produce ilegalmente en cualquier otro país y lo envía en Estados Unidos y yo lo detecto, el banano se decomisa, se multa y se destruye. Esa es la protección que me daría la patente en los países eh, donde lo podamos patentar en Estados Unidos y Europa en los mercados de exportación. Pero la idea es de que, el, que el, el productor que acoja estas variedades y las empiece a producir, le pague un canon a, a cualquiera de las empresas asociadas con ellos para resarcir los gastos que se han invertido. Muchas gracias. Como le digo, hasta ahora ningún gobierno, perdón, Víctor, ningún gobierno ha expresado interés en unirse a este proyecto. Eh, todo lo que nosotros vemos es que todos siguen interesados en contención, prevención, regulaciones y demás, pero ninguno eh, ha dicho yo quiero participar en el desarrollo de nuevas variedades. Aquí está mi aporte. Eso no lo hemos visto nosotros hasta ahora. Gracias. Sí, adelante, gracias. Adelante, don Miguel. Gracias, Víctor. Gracias, Adolfo. Yo creo que es una, una discusión. Eh, hay una pregunta cortita para, para eso que usted acabó de mencionar, porque se, se prevé que paguen quizás algo por un tiempo, ¿no? Para, realmente para compensar eso. Es realmente, eh, o sea, entendible, ¿no? Pero hay... Yo sé que están todavía trabajando en ese proceso, pero ¿habría eventualmente un tiempo, por ejemplo, un periodo de, de aporte y después serían libres? O, o, yo, o eso depende de las leyes de cada país, yo creo, ¿no? Bueno. Sí, eso, es, eso, eso no, 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 no eso, eso no se ha decidido todavía. Pero eh, yo eso lo que sí veo es, pues, se, se habla mucho de, y hoy se mencionó relativamente poco en estos días sobre la diversidad de las otras musáceas. Y veo que los esfuerzos que están dirigidos a mejoramiento genético en este momento, eh, los principales son para Cavendish. Eh, a mí me gustaría aquí personalmente en FIA tener un poco más de financiamiento adicional solo para plátanos o solo para otras variedades diferentes de, de tipos, eh, tipo prata con alto contenido de tacaroteno, etcétera, la lista que les mantiene ayer. Y para eso no tenemos financiamiento. Los fondos que tenemos ahora son prácticamente, eh, el, yo diría el 75% es para Cavendish y el otro 25% es para Gros Michel y Cavendish, eh, puros o combinados. Eso es todo lo que tenemos. Pero los demás materiales tenemos las madres listas, pero no estamos haciendo absolutamente nada por falta de fondos. Vale, eh, Víctor, solamente para completar la aprobación que tenía en el micrófono, yo, yo, yo creo, simplemente es un, ya un poco saliendo a la parte de desarrollo de variedades, yo sé que es el principal objetivo de, de este seminario, eh, pero yo creo que es mi deber un poquito también de, de, de decir que todavía, todavía es mucho más importante, es mucho, mucho, pero mucho, mucho, o sea, muy, muy importante todavía mantener países libres de la enfermedad y continuar con programas de contención en lo que una variedad realmente está disponible para, para los países. O sea, estamos hablando de variedades, yo digo, para el público que está importantísimo, está discutiendo, yo estoy súper contento de que veo que hay avances, de verdad, todo eso, pero todavía así del, del quita una y con la otra y vas a tener, no vas a tener problemas, como en teoría pasaría con Bruce Michel siendo sustituido por, por Cavendish, 
pero en mi experiencia es lo que hemos visto todavía, me parece que no. O sea, muy importante discutir la parte de variedades, pero todavía seguir importante con las cuestiones de prevención y contención y todo esto que tienen los países. Yo, yo, yo estoy de acuerdo un poco con, con, con Adolfo, hay que trabajar en paralelo, hay que pensar que es un día puede llegar y ya tener que, por ejemplo, adelantado, porque desarrollar variedades cuesta, pero tampoco olvidarnos quizás de, 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 la, de la biosidoridad en la fin que la prevención continúa siendo claves, al menos para América Latina y Absolutamente. Voy a pasar a inglés. I, I wonder if any of the other panelists uh, we had before, James Dale, Eli Kayat, um, Frederick Barkby, Altus, do you join? I wonder, or Mr. Sorensen, I wonder if they have any, any input, or any suggestion on this uh, aspect of the intellectual property of new varieties. I can uh, speak. This is uh, Eli Kayat. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I think like every other technology, uh, it, it's really, uh, uh, it, it's important to protect uh, the rights by uh, uh, patents or uh, breeders' rights. I think that, uh, uh, you know, we are doing, especially uh, uh, us that uh, work for commercial companies, uh, we, we, it, it's part of our uh, of our tasks, you know, to protect uh, the, the rights of the company. And uh, I don't see any, uh, uh, why should anybody be inhibited from, uh, because the growers uh, will benefit from it uh, as well as uh, we do. And so uh, it's only normal that we uh, issue patents and actually on this TR4 resistance that uh, we, uh, we, we have developed, we, uh, we, we have uh, uh, patents uh, worldwide, uh, probably in uh, more than 20 countries, anywhere where bananas are being produced or uh, imported. Uh, we, we, we issued the protection uh, method. And we, our, our patent is uh, on, uh, uh, on the method itself. So it's a utility patent. It's not just a, a breeder's rights or a plant patent, but it's a utility patent. And it's important that uh, uh, breeders and, and the people that uh, spend uh, a big uh, part of their lives will benefit from their work, uh, unless they uh, get uh, funded from uh, international organizations or something like that. Perfect, excellent. I'd like now to give the screen to the next one, the next who um, raised his hand, Dr. Or Mr. Sorensen, please, you have the screen. Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the issue of uh, varieties and uh, how they could be available and how that could turn into a sustainable system, I would say, for bananas. I think there's a lot to learn from other sectors that are working with plants in general, and where a system uh, which has been mainly fueled by the concept of plant breeders' rights has turned into an industry that is continually de delivering innovations in plants because there is a system of rewarding the breeder for his efforts by paying a price for the material, which will then continue the breeding process. And after a number of years, this system uh, is a best guarantee for a sustainable, continuous delivery of novel innovations, also for bananas. So I don't think uh, banana industry has to reinvent the wheel. There are many plant sectors where this is working very well that we can copy. copy. Once we get out of this monoculture and into a diversity of banana varieties in the market. Excellent, thank you very much. Dr. Bakri. Yes, yes thank you. Thank you for giving me the, for giving me the talk. Uh, for for uh, any way, I think that any activities of uh, banana breeding uh, of improvement activities must be found. And the difficulty is to reflect about the, the way we want to choose to fund these activities. And uh, clearly, uh, we has uh, be remembered by Eli, uh, we can't uh, Put patent or, 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 or on technologies, we can have plant with the right, but maybe regarding the particularity of this of, of this plant, which are, which can be easily vegetatively propagated, 
I'm not absolutely convinced that uh, plant wither rice can be uh, recognized and established for uh, most of the countries around the world. Uh, so that I think that um, probably we have to think about a system uh, of partnership with uh, uh, common partnership with uh, with many stakeholders from the industry, banana industry, or for research and so on, and uh, which will finance the research and then which will which will have the priority to the research, giving them a commercial advantage in terms of competitivity to reach uh, some, some markets. Because it, it will be extremely difficult to, 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 to make uh, recognizable the plant with the rights in most parts of the, of the world. It was, it was just a, a commentary. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm mindful of the time. We exceeded the time in five minutes. We have interpretation available. So uh, for the sake of time and also your agendas, of course, I would like now to pass the screen to um, Mrs. Raisa Jauger, agricultural officer in the, in the office in Mesoamerica to provide the closing remarks. Raisa, you have the screen. Thank you. Tienes la palabra. Adelante. Sí, Víctor, eh, muchas gracias y realmente muchas gracias a todos los panelistas y a los colegas que se han unido con nosotros en estos dos días de webinario. Como bien dijiste al inicio, o sea, el tema de las variedades, eh, tendremos otros momentos para discusión y llevar a cabo esta agenda que venimos realizando con el Foro Mundial Bananero en el fortalecimiento de las capacidades de, de la región. Eh, han sido dos días de webinario con temas que hoy ocupan una de las prioridades dentro de la agroindustria bananera. Eh, se han tratado temas de gran interés con respecto a todo lo que eh, puede ser la tecnología para la edición de genes. Y por otra parte, eh, también eh, todo lo que eh, abordaron con temas para la introducción de germoplasma en las diferentes eh, regiones. Es importante también ver hoy hacia dónde se enmarcan las nuevas investigaciones en las políticas de, de variedades y de manera general eh, cabe señalar la importancia de tener siempre un movimiento de germoplasma seguro, evitando por supuesto los riesgos de entrada de, e ingresos de otras probables enfermedades cuarentenarias presentes o no en diferentes regiones de, a nivel global. Y la necesidad, por supuesto, de programas de entrenamiento, capacitación para los productores con el fin de conocer cómo manejar estas nuevas variedades tolerantes o parcialmente resistentes a la raza 4 tropical. Una vez más se resalta la importancia de la vinculación de la agenda científica con las agendas también que llevan tanto diferentes instituciones del sector público como el sector privado para tener una mejor estrategia en el manejo de la raza 4 tropical. Hay una gran reflexión sobre la diversificación de clones para consumos diferentes a Cavendish y por supuesto todo lo relacionado con la disposición a todos los sectores, a todo público y todo lo que tiene que enfrentar también la cadena eh, comercial. Se resalta una vez más la necesidad de fortalecer la institucionalidad y los roles de los diferentes sectores y organismos tanto del sector público y privado para asegurar un movimiento de germoplasma con bioseguridad. Para cerrar, aunque estemos en un seminario, fundamentalmente este webinario para el tema de variedades, sí queremos siempre continuar con el llamado para los países que no tienen presente la raza 4 tropical, continuar todos los esfuerzos en cuanto a la prevención y además también en los que están presentes y a nivel global en la contención eh, de la enfermedad, de manera que nos podemos eh, preparar aún mejor 
para enfrentar la raza cuatro tropical y otras enfermedades eh, cuarentenarias también que son de gran importancia para la agroindustria del banano. Agradecemos a todos los colegas que se han unido con nosotros estos dos días de webinario. Estaremos compartiendo también a través del Foro Mundial de Banano todo un resumen de eh, estas sesiones de webinario y por supuesto, Víctor, como hemos pensado, continuaremos con todos estos esfuerzos en capacitación a, a, a no solo para la región de América Latina y Caribe, sino a nivel global también. Gracias, Víctor. Ahora se me escucha. Muchas gracias, Raisa. Excelente cierre. Y repetir lo que ha dicho, seguimos trabajando, seguimos informando eh, desde FAO y, y sobre todo desde la plataforma de la red global de R4T. Continuaremos sobre todo con este tema de variedades que, que creo necesitamos más ponencias y más discusión y eso será seguramente en los próximos dos o tres meses organizaremos el próximo webinario. Entonces hago también un llamado para que si eh, tienen panelistas que que ofrecer, que nos indiquen para poder generar esta agenda y, y tener discusiones interesantes al respecto. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros estos dos días y me despido con un abrazo y esperando verles pronto y seguir trabajando con ustedes. Hasta luego, gracias. Gracias, gracias a todos.